Hey guys, this is Justin. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, first of all. I am taking a few days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks if I feel a little wacky, away from YouTube. Let's be honest, I'm a workaholic. I'll be back sooner than that. But in the meantime, I thought I'd give you guys a few special uploads. So over here on the Eckhart's Ladder channel, I thought I would take some time and put together some big compilation videos. I know a lot of you guys like to put my videos on and do other things. So today I'm giving you two hours of weird lore in Star Wars. We'll focus primarily on the unknown regions, with our first videos serving as introductions and later videos going more in depth on certain topics. Then, towards the end of the video, we're just going to go further into the wacky and weird from Star Wars, things from other dimensions, unexplained phenomena. I think you get the idea. Then, if you guys watch through to the very end, my last couple of videos are going to be special. Some of my earliest uploads, which I'm sure many of you guys probably found the channel through. And I think you'll notice throughout this video that the quality has changed, and I'm interested to read the comments down below see which era of my uploads you've liked the most. On that note, I've made sure not to include any videos which are super recent. I think the newest one is still about eight months old. So if you've been catching up with recent videos, don't worry, there still should be lots in here for you. I've also made sure to cut out any sponsored bits, any intros and outros. So although the first few seconds of the video might sound a bit weird, you're getting right to the meat of the content. Also, I'm going to include timestamps in the description so you can skip ahead to the next video in sequence if you want. With that being said, let's roll. It. I always liked the idea that things get more weird and mysterious the further you are away from Coruscant in the Galactic Core. The Unknown Region, of course, is full of mysteries and dangers, but beyond the Galactic Rim, there's sort of the idea that there could be anything lurking out there. That being said, Star Wars generally keeps its stories within the galaxy proper, and we don't even really hear histories in-universe of those who try to make the journey beyond. This is a really relevant conversation because right now on my podcast, Tap Capture transmissions. We've just started the new Jedi Order. I will say, by the way, if you haven't read Star Wars Legends and you want to get into it, now is the perfect time. Tapcaf Transmissions is almost like a book club that I run. You can either read alongside us or just listen to us talk about the book. Vector Prime, book one of the NJO, was done last Thursday. We've got our next book, the Thursday after this week. I'll put a link to everything down below. All right, so before we really get into things, I do have to make one quick clarification and distinction. The Star Wars Galaxy has several smaller satellite galaxies, which the new Essential Guide to Warfare labels galaxies A through G. Galaxies A and B are very close to the main Star Wars galaxy, with B being only about 150,000 light years away. The other galaxies were much farther. So when I talk about extragalactic travel, I'm not counting travel to those galaxies, nor the other small star systems like Kamino or clusters or whatever else, which were really close to the Star Wars galaxy, but technically beyond the rim. All right, so the basic thing that makes travel beyond the edges of the Star Wars galaxy difficult and certainly deep into intergalactic space is what's been called the hyperspace turbulence or the hyperspace barrier outside the galaxy. The new Essential Atlas describes this as a hyperspace tangle, which strangely doesn't have a real space counterpart. I call this strange because most phenomenon which exists in hyperspace are shadows of things that exist in real space, whether moons or stars or planets or any sort of real space phenomenon. The hyperspace anomaly or the hyperspace barrier is different, and there are a bunch of theories about why that may be. Either way, by the Yuzhan Vong era, it was widely understood that travel in and out of the galaxy would be very, very difficult, if not completely impossible. In fact, as we learn in Dark Tide 1, this was a factor that caused the New Republic to respond slowly to the Yuzhan Vong's initial incursion. They didn't believe that the galaxy could be entered from the outside. Part of the reason I'm doing this video is because Vector Prime actually gives a really good description of what scientists thought about extragalactic space. This is a quote that, for whatever reason, I didn't mention in prior videos. So, here it is. Before this moment, no one had ever witnessed evidence of, let alone the actual event of, an extragalactic breach. Many scientists argued that such a breach could not even be accomplished. Certainly, several brave explorers and a couple of desperate outlaws being chased by the authorities had gone into the turbulence of the galactic 
Pacific Rim over the last few decades, but none had ever been heard from again. Here might be the answer and the questions. So the book explains that something exists outside the galaxy, as we've discussed, that causes people to, well, not return. That actually significantly increases the lethality of the galactic barrier compared to the prior description, and also makes clear that people have tried it, but no one has returned. The character whose thoughts were intruding on in that passage is known as Danny Kui. She was a member of the Exgal Society. The Exgal Society had outposts on various worlds near the very edge of the galaxy and essentially set up listening posts to look for extra galactic signals. The discovery of what they thought to be a large rock but was in reality a Yuzhan Vong world ship was incredibly strange. They assumed that it either had anomalous properties, that it was actually a tightly packed set of gas, or that the mass had somehow passed through a strange gravitational field to allow it to bypass the barrier. In reality, what happened is the Yuzhan Vong traveled through an area of space known as Vector Prime. Vector Prime was one of perhaps several areas in the galaxy where this barrier, for some reason, did not exist. If you imagine a giant moat between the galaxy and extragalactic space, Vector Prime is sort of like a bridge. How many of these bridges were there? Did the Yuzhan Vong perhaps create it with their gravity manipulation creatures known as Dovin Basils? It's kind of hard to say. There is also, I will say, the distinct possibility that the hyperspace anomaly is simply imagined, and I know that was once a more popular theory online, but I think some of the new more modern sources, including the Essential Atlas, have made it pretty clear that this was a real phenomenon. One thing I will note too that's, I think, not not without a good explanation is the fact that some sources describe the barrier as only surrounding the western side of the galaxy. Some almost make a differentiation between some mythical barrier that surrounds the galaxy and also the hyperspace bramble that permeates all the way to the deep core and is primarily west of the deep core. I don't know for sure, but this is kind of how I imagine it. I've put an illustration on the screen here, which also indicates how travel to the satellite galaxies would be possible. The outbound flight was actually meant to break through this barrier and get to extragalactic space. This was a very interesting project. It was organized by Jedi Master Jorah Sabayoth. If you've read the Thrawn trilogy, you probably recognize his name. And basically the idea was that with several Jedi Masters and students, they would use the Force to simply break through and continue on their journey. The outbound flight was destroyed in the unknown regions. I think a very interesting story could have been the outbound flight or perhaps some other Jedi expedition making it outside the galaxy, being lost for hundreds or maybe even thousands of years, then coming back disturbed and warped by their time in the void with several generations of Jedi or rather dark Jedi ready to enact their revenge. In canon, there's a similar idea. Travel outside beyond the galaxy can cause insanity, madness, signals get destroyed distorted navigation largely becomes impossible and most people don't return. It's the same with legends. We don't know exactly how people die, whether they collide with something while traveling through hyperspace or simply get lost and can't find their way home, but the end result is pretty much the same. There's the legend of the Amaxine warriors in Star Wars canon, who we hear about most notably in Bloodline and Into the Dark, who purportedly left the galaxy, but more likely were simply destroyed by the Drengir. Today, we'll be looking at what actually exists outside the Star Wars galaxy, a topic that we've somewhat addressed before, but we'll do so comprehensively today. It almost goes without saying that Star Wars exists in a universe with other galaxies, perhaps even our own, if we take the opening crawl for its word. In Legends, there was even an organization known as the Exgal Society, which was meant to monitor for extragalactic communications and activities. Notably, an Exgal outpost was the first true target for the Praetoriate Vong as they invaded. On that note, a good place to start this video is by looking at other galaxies, including the Yuzon Vong's ancestral galaxy, which was decimated by wars, causing the Vong to leave in the first place. We're not actually sure where this galaxy was, but the Vong had been traveling throughout the intergalactic void for thousands of years, so long that they forgot their early history. And during the New Jedi Order, it's suggested that they actually stopped or visited other dead galaxies before finally invading. 
invading. Similar to the Yuuzhan Vong, there was another galaxy destroyed by war, which we learn about in issue 38 of the Marvel Star Wars comics. Basically, the ship and its pilot are the only known survivors of a devastating war, and it discovers Luke and Leia after the two accidentally travel into the intergalactic void. If you're interesting, I've covered this entire issue in a dedicated video, which I'll link above. Interestingly, it's possible that one of these galaxies may have been a companion to the galaxy far, far away. And in fact, the unreleased and thus non-canon novella, Supernatural Encounters, The Trial and Transformation of Our Whole Hextrophon, outright states that the Yuuzhan Vong did come from a companion galaxy. But again, though that's available to read online, it isn't canon. Anyway, back on topic. There were seven galaxies at the very least orbiting the main Star Wars galaxy. These are referenced in the Essential Atlas, which has the following quote. Then there are the dwarf satellite galaxies, some of which have 20 billion stars. They're ranked by distance, closer ones first. Now, I'll talk about the first two in a bit more detail in just a second, but the book goes on to say that the third and further galaxies are much further than at least 150,000 light years far away, and likely never visited. However, dwarf galaxies represent only a portion of extragalactic stellar objects. There are also around 200 globular clusters, with hundreds of thousands of stars each, and these are significantly above or below the galactic rim, such that they're not properly part of the galaxy, but they're also self-contained. A good example of this was Cosm's Well, which was noted for being very beautiful. There were other bodies still near the rim, but technically extragalactic, like the Red Nebula from the classic Star Wars Marvel run, or more notably, the planet of Kamino, which is described as being near the Rishi Maze. Arguably, portions of the unknown regions could also be considered extragalactic, like the Cyrus Star Cluster, and if we're being specific, the Empire actually considered the companion galaxies as part of the unknown regions, but I'll leave it at that today. As a note, in Legends, but not canon, the rendezvous location for the Rebel fleet at the end of The Empire Strikes Back was known as Haven and was outside the galaxy. Speaking of, now is probably a good time to return and cover the Rishi Maze and Fire Fist, the two nearest companion galaxies. The Rishi Maze is described in the Essential Atlas as containing only a few inhabited worlds, though it is visited by Han and Chewie in the short story Maze Run, during which they visited not only a rebel refinery, but also ran into a derelict Sith ship. Fire Fist, on the other hand, features in the final arc of the Marvel comics, and is home to several invading alien races. That being said, it was almost never visited by inhabitants of the Star Wars galaxy and was more or less unknown. And really, that's true generally for extragalactic locations. Although efforts were made, especially with the outbound flight project, we don't have any records of successful expeditions. And this is partially because of the hyperspace anomaly, which seemed to cut off large portions of the galaxy from intergalactic space. One noted hole in the barrier was Vector Prime, where the Vong entered. Some have hypothesized that this feature was created by the Celestials in Ancient Race, and I've discussed that in a prior video, which I'll link above. In both Legends and Canon, Palpatine was interested in exploring not only the Unknown Regions, but also other galaxies. Canon has described those attempting to leave the galaxy as returning mad due to isolation or death. Meanwhile, Palpatine had observatories plotting tracks outside the Galactic Rim. Legends Palpatine had similar aspirations, and the the Dark Empire was intended to be universe-spanning, as described by the Dark Empire sourcebook. As a final note, the Charon race, which we'll briefly mention later, is described as a killer of galaxies, which I think is interesting language. But let's get a little bit weirder. There are more than just physical extragalactic locations. There are what I'd call different realms, and the best example of this would be hyperspace, which is actually another dimension. Other space, on the other hand, was a sort of dimension between between real space and hyperspace, and was home to species like the Charon, who were trapped there. This dimension seemed to be naturally created, however others weren't, including the City of Dreams created by Cody Sunchild, or the pocket dimension that Wutsek used when stealing vessels from the Hell Hoop. Waru, the Rosum, and the Nal Nal were also said to come from another dimension, and Waru speaks of his own galaxy, but details here are pretty scant. Getting more mystical, Legends gives us Chaos, which is basically Hell, where evil spirits go, and the other world, which is sort of like Ewok Hell. In canon, we have the world between worlds, and both universes have spirit realms. 
worlds. Aside from that, the Bedlam spirits were said to be able to seamlessly travel across space and time. As many of you know, I find the idea of an unknown regions in the Star Wars galaxy to be incredibly interesting. There is this one portion of space that even in a galaxy full of trillions upon trillions of beings is largely unexplored and unknown. Various Star Wars books, including the Thrawn duology and the new canon Thrawn trilogy, have elevated this mystery by hinting at disturbing and unimaginable horrors waiting among the stars. Today, I thought we'd take a look at some of the worst entities, beings, creatures and species which find their home in the unknown regions. The first evil that comes to mind is one that's unfortunately quite ordinary in the Star Wars universe, and I speak of the Vagari, a civilization made up of interstellar slavers. The Vagari were a race which the Chiss, who served as an almost bright spot in the unknown regions, sometimes clashed with. The Chiss actually thought that the Vagari were extinct due to past conflicts, but in the post-Endor period it's discovered that the Vagari in fact still survived, and it simply went into hiding. As mentioned, the Vagari are frequently described as slavers. We're not exactly sure what they used the slaves for, whether they sold them or put them into service somehow. We do know, however, from the outbound flight, that slaves were kept on the outside of Vagari ships in small bubbles so that they could operate as a sort of shield. This was particularly effective if a race was trying to rescue those who were enslaved. They wouldn't want to fire on the Vagari, lest they risk destroying destroying those on board. As we see in the outbound flight, this would also work very well against beings like Jedi. A similar faction that you'd certainly want to avoid in the Unknown Regions was the Ibruchi. The Ibruchi were a violent race which often operated nomadically in the Unknown Regions as pirates trying to survive in the harsh areas of space they've inhabited for thousands of years. According to the Unknown Regions source book, the Ibruchi had their homeworld devastated by the Vagari, and somewhat ironically, given the fact that they were attacked by the Vagari, became interstellar slavers in their own right. The Ibruchi are an incredibly cold and pragmatic species. While they do enjoy inflicting pain onto others, they'll also, when possible, take hostages or even useful outsiders in as members of their pirate crew. They're so deadly, however, because they hunt the hyperspace lanes and frequently respond with overwhelming force to destroy destroy and plunder those who travel alone. Like many in the unknown regions, they're a species completely devoid of kindness, of sympathy, and of weakness. Next, we're going to cover a species which I've discussed many times on this channel before, so feel free to skip through if you want. I'm referring to the Nal Nal. The Nal Nal is basically as close as Star Wars gets to having a flood-like species, although it appears simply to be gray ooze. The Nal Nal is actually a single, self-aware intelligence. The homeworld of the Nal Nal, or at least the place where they're most present, is a world known as Mug Fallow. There, the Nal Nal form entire oceans of gray fluid and take weird forms on the planet's surface. According to the Unknown Region Sourcebook, and I quote, it is clear that Nal Nal has malevolent intent its primary tactics of aggression, infecting other beings and spreading off-world inside their husks, do not appear to be based on any sort of survival instinct. Instead, it seems to thrive on the suffering of others. As that passage alludes to, the Nal Nal can take over the corpses of sentient beings, essentially hollowing them out with the gray fluid and then transmitting further to others. And this, alongside the central intelligence, is where the comparison to the Flood in Halo is most apt. However, instead of simply taking over over a being's nervous system, it literally hollows out the creature and replaces it with itself. The source book also alludes to a strange history of the Nal Nal, the fact that they may be from another dimension, that they have said to existed longer than any civilization in the galaxy, that they may have even caused the Celestials to leave and form the hyperspace barrier, which now prevents outside travel. Either way, it's rumored that Mug Follow is ringed by orbiting derelict ships from every era of spaceflight in the Star Wars universe. Being infected by the Nal Nal is not a pleasant experience. It's incredibly painful, and again, according to the guide, within 24 hours you are, and I quote, entirely filled with viscous pus. Not a very pleasant image there. The bodies then are often puppeted by the hive mind in a way that will cause pain to any who are in the immediate vicinity. Not just physical pain, also emotional pain as well. Moving on though, the next faction I wanted to talk about is one of my favorite kind of minor factions in the Star Wars galaxy, and that is the Psy Rook. We first learn of the Psy Rook in the Truce at Bakura, where they, of course, attack the planet Bakura 
almost immediately after the Empire's defeat at the Battle of Endor. The Cyruk are essentially very powerful, well-muscled dinosaurs, but it's really their technology which is the most terrifying aspect of their dominion. The Cyruk use a technique known as Intechment, which essentially steals the life force or the energy of a living being, trapping it within a battle droid or some other mechanical construct. You can be captured by the Sea Rook, have your life force stolen, and essentially serve in a semi-conscious state as like a light bulb or a windshield wiper or something on a Sea Ruvi ship, all while being in extreme pain. I've called this one of the worst fates in Star Wars, and really it is. As this is happening, and as you're experiencing this new form of life, the pain is so awful that many souls essentially scream themselves into insanity and have to be discarded. The Sea Ruvi Imperium also has an incredibly powerful military, especially given the fact that if a planet is conquered, its inhabitants can be used to power more battle droids, essentially creating a slippery slope anytime an invasion begins. The Sea Ruvi Imperium is very, very far from the galaxy's core, pretty much on the rim itself, if not in extragalactic space. The Sea Ruvi were also beat down quite heavily by the New Republic and the Empire after Endor, but they still could expand and are an incredibly aggressive and dangerous alien race. I also wanted to briefly mention the navigational hazards of the Unknown Region. I covered this very recently, so I'm only going to be brief. Basically, travel through the Unknown Region is very difficult. Not only is that area of the galaxy less well mapped, but there's also a hyperspace disturbance which bisects the Unknown Region and can completely disrupt travel. There's also the rumor of far stranger entities. For example, the Unknown Region has been tied to the appearance of several ghost ships, and planets like Duras are said to perhaps even have have been cursed by the dark side. Aside from that, much of the Unknown Regions is also inhospitable, but there are also other planets which have either not been discovered or which have very little sentient life, which could of course serve as a potential refuge for any who discover it. The final thing I want to mention is that Palpatine had a real interest in the Unknown Regions. He didn't really open that galaxy up to exploration to the same degree he did with other parts of space, but there's evidence in both Legends and Canon that the Unknown Regions was home to secret projects, shipyards, and facilities. Most famously, we have the Empire of the Hand. This was established by Palpatine, but more directly by Thrawn, and was a sort of combination of the Empire and the Chiss. It was an extraordinarily powerful force, as the Empire proper was declining, and was meant to serve not only as reinforcement, but also as a bulwark against galactic invaders or threats like the Yuuzhan Vong. Unlike the Chiss, they wouldn't have shared the same policies of non-aggression and would have done anything if necessary to keep their presence secret. Star Wars canon has maintained basically every aspect of galactic geography established in Legends. One major difference has appeared, the relationship between Wild Space, the Unknown Regions, and the rest of the galaxy. Let's start with the Star Wars Legends Expanded Universe, and a very quick overview of the areas of the galaxy. At the interior of the galaxy is the Core and the Deep Core. Then we have various middle territories, including the Inner Rim, the Expansion Region, the Mid Rim, and others. Depending on the era. Then we have the edge of the galaxy, where things get, in my opinion at least, more interesting. The Outer Rim encompasses much of the exterior of the galaxy, and is mostly mapped out with many inhabited worlds. To the galactic west was the Unknown Regions, an area largely unexplored and very dangerous. Then finally we have Wild Space to the southeast, which according to the Star Wars Encyclopedia is the galaxy's true frontier. Once considered part of the Unknown Regions, Regions, this area was opened up to exploration and settlement as one of Palpatine's last acts. Based on what I've said so far, you might be wondering what the actual difference between Wild Space and the Unknown Regions is. Thankfully, the Essential Atlas does a great job of showing the difference between the two. And I quote, Wild Space has been explored, however minimally, with the findings recorded in official logs, while the Unknown Regions have not. The worlds of Wild Space largely ignore the Central Galactic Government. The Unknown Regions describes 
all areas that have never been directly surveyed, and technically includes the galactic disk's halo of gas, dust, and stars, as well as satellite galaxies. So Wild Space and Legends was an area of the Unknown Regions which was specifically opened up for exploration. While the Unknown Regions, despite usually referencing the area of space in the Galactic West, is technically everything that is unexplored, and by some estimates actually includes more space than the known galaxy. However, this relationship was changed significantly in canon, as explained by Pablo on an episode of Rebels Recon. So what exactly is the difference between wild space and the unknown regions? The unknown regions are an area of the galaxy where the borders are known, but it hasn't really been explored. So think of it as like a dark jungle that no one's ever gone into, mm -hmm. whereas wild space is more like off the edge of the map where no one knows what's on the other side. Very cool. Thanks, Pablo. So the unknown regions, as we can see from this canon map, seem to include the same area of the galactic west here, but not everything outside of that, as was the case in Legends. This is confirmed by a map within the Canon Galactic Atlas, which describes the Unknown Regions as the westward arm of the galaxy. Wild Space now has assumed this more expansive role, and is described in the same atlas as anywhere beyond the Outer Rim. We see Mortis, for example, which we know to be in Wild Space, is in the Galactic North, which likely would not have been the case in Legends. Planets like Camino or the Satellite Galaxies, would now likely be considered within Wild Space. People have been stating since the aftermath trilogy that the Unknown Regions will be very important to the coming canon. Technically, I think this isn't totally correct, or at least it doesn't describe the complete truth. We do know that the First Order formed in the Unknown Regions, which, given the change in definition, actually narrows down their position somewhat, but Palpatine would have been probing not only the Unknown Regions, but also Wild Space, and Snoke himself may have come from that region instead of the Unknown Regions. Why was this change made? I'm really not sure. But I wouldn't be surprised if Lucasfilm is saving Wild Space for future adventures, or if perhaps they're trying to make it seem even more mysterious. Wild Space truly is uncharted territory, and one of the only planets we know of in Wild Space is perhaps the most mysterious in the galaxy, Mortis. Regardless, there is 100% a reason why there was a change in the fundamentals of the galaxy like this. Perhaps they found the distinction between Wild Space and the Unknown Regions was too confusing in Legends, but I don't necessarily think that that's the case. The Empire was evil. The Sith are evil. Both of these, however, fail to compare to the evil locked for millennia behind the black hole cluster of the Maw, an ancient evil, one that used lesser beings, a cosmic force that slithers into consciousnesses from across space, breaking minds. With that being said, the focus of today's video will be a very basic primer on the creature known as Abeloth, including the events that led up to her release from her prison within the Maw. Later, we'll cover her early history, her defeat, the force psychosis she inflicted on Jedi, and more. If there's anything in particular you guys would like me to cover in extra depth, let me know down in the comments. Abeloth was born, a mortal being, over 100,000 years before the Battle of Yavin. She lived and served the Ones, a family of Celestials, eventually taking the role of mother to the father, son, and daughter. However, wanting power similar to her immortal adopted family, Abeloth drank from the Font of Power and bathed in the pool of knowledge, both ancient, mysterious, and extraordinarily powerful force nexuses found on a planet within the Maw. These experiences began her corruption and transformation into the powerful and twisted creature known as Abeloth, which would go on to terrify the galaxy. As an aside, it's possible that there are, or maybe in the future, more beings like Abeloth. Sith High Lord Sarasu Talon also bathed in the pool of knowledge, and began to transform also into an Abeloth-like creature, developing incredible force powers while losing human biological needs and instead feeding on dark side energy. He was killed in the early stages of his transformation, but it seems like he was taking the first steps of becoming an Abeloth-like creature. The ones who were furious at Abeloth's actions and who saw her transformation as potentially dangerous used the Killick slave race to create gigantic gravity manipulation devices, including sinkhole and center point stations. With these, they created a cluster of black holes around Abeloth's planet, isolating her in what would become the Maw. 
Not only was she unable to physically leave her planet because of the black hole sheath, but her powers too were seemingly limited to this area. More on this in just a minute. Physically, Abeloth is capable of taking a variety of forms, and is known for consuming beings, then impersonating them. She could alter her appearance seemingly at will, however, did also have a true form. Her experiences had warped her, her skin stretched across her body thinly, she had large but dark eyes glittering with small points of light, like miniature galaxies. She had faint blonde hair, which reached to the ground, a sharp, tooth-filled mouth that stretched horribly from ear to ear, and stubby arms which turned into many tentacles. Abeloth often radiated energy, especially during battle. Sometimes this even manifested visually, as a cloud around her, or even electricity. In battle, Abeloth is absolutely ferocious. She has an incredible grasp on both the dark and light side of the force, but often attacks physically, whipping her tentacles around at lightning speed or body slamming opponents. All in all, she was extremely powerful, and Luke estimated perhaps dozens of times more powerful than himself. But she was also very difficult to kill. While she could be injured conventionally with the force or a lightsaber, Abeloth would usually flee if overwhelmed. She could teleport if she was injured, and if her body was destroyed, she could seemingly regenerate based on the power provided by beings which she had corrupted into her service, as was the case with Dion's dad, Callista Ming, and others. This form of consumption was really Abeloth's most nefarious power. She was always hungry and wanting. She was a great source of energy which called to force users, often seducing beings into approaching her then fully consuming their life energy, which also allowed her to take on their form. Her hunger and unending desire to consume actually manifested in the Force. While trapped within the Maw, Abeloth was continually calling out, and Force sensitives in the area would feel her presence. During the short term, they would feel a malevolent cosmic entity, as was the case with Ben Skywalker as a child or Alana Solo on Kessel. However, prolonged exposure or presence in the area could lead to falling directly under her influence. This was the case for the mind walkers of Sinkhole Station, as well as the Jedi children hidden at shelter during the Yuzhan Vong War. Regarding the latter, as Jedi were hunted down by the Yuzhan Vong, many younglings were hidden at shelter, a refuge within the Maw. There, Abeloth was able to touch them in the Force, and in 43 ABY, the Jedi who had been present there as children almost uniformly developed a Force psychosis, which caused them to think that everyone in their life was an imposter, resulting of course in extreme confusion and violence. Ben Skywalker, for example, was only spared because he refused to touch the Force during the Yuzhan Vong War because of the extreme amount of pain and suffering within the galaxy. The only way the spell could be broke was if Abeloth herself was weakened. This happened after she was defeated for the first time by a Jedi Sith coalition, but of course she escaped the first battle and very quickly sought for sensitive beings to further her power. Although Abeloth had allegedly escaped her home in the past, only to be re-secured by the Ones or the Celestials, her most notable escape was after their death. This led to the aforementioned Force Psychosis and her conflict with Force users in the galaxy. During the Second Galactic Civil War, Centerpoint Station in the Corellian System was destroyed. Aside from the forming of the Corellian System, Centerpoint Station was used in conjunction with the smaller but similar Sinkhole Station to hold the Sphere of Black Holes together, which isolated Abeloth from the rest of the galaxy. When Centerpoint Station was destroyed, a crack opened in the sphere, which gradually got larger, and Abeloth was able to eventually escape on the Sith Meditation Sphere ship while also destroying Sinkhole Station. However, even before her physical escape, Abeloth had other means of interacting with the galaxy. One was in the realm beyond shadows, where she appeared before both Jason Solo during his five-year sojourn and Luke and his son Ben. Also, simply approaching the area filled Ben with revulsion as he remembered the brief contact he had with the entity as a small child.
When the Yuuzhan Vong invaded the galaxy, they realized that their greatest threat was not the traditional militaries of the New Republic, Empire, or other factions, but rather the Jedi. Thus, they used several techniques in an attempt to purge the Jedi from the galaxy, including the creation of weapons like the Voxen, specialized Jedi hunters, and threatening populations if they did not turn in fugitive Jedi. In response, the Order did what it could to protect their numbers, and one way this manifests was the creation of a secret base in the Maw Cluster, a base known as Shelter. Nearly an entire generation of Jedi were housed at Shelter during the Vong War, mostly those too young to contribute to the war effort. However, despite its name, the Jedi at Shelter were not safe from threats, and in fact, had simply left the frying pan only to be thrown into the fire. Within the Maw, a malevolent, dark, cosmic entity locked behind a protective cluster of black holes for eons began to exert her influence on the young force sensitives. I'm talking of course about Abeloth. For most of his time at Shelter, Ben Skywalker cut himself off from the Force because of the devastation caused by the Yuuzhan Vong War. However, for a while, he felt the gaze of Abeloth himself. This is what he remembered. Two-year-old Ben reached towards the shadow with his free hand and his heart, and he sensed his mother and father reaching back. Though he was too young to know he was being touched through the Force, he stopped being afraid until a dark tentacle of need began to slither up into the aching tear of his abandonment. He thought for an instant that he was just sad about being left behind, but the tentacle grew as real as his breath, and he began to sense it, an alien loneliness as desperate and profound as his own. It wanted to draw him close and keep him safe, to take the place of his parents and never let him be alone again. Thankfully for Ben, he wasn't at shelter for very long, and close to the force only encountered Abeloth scarcely. However, the being slithered her way into not only the mind of Ben, but all sheltered Jedi, peppering them with the force and feelings of intense loneliness and neediness. As we discussed in an earlier video, Abeloth had massive powers within the Maw, and even young Alana Solo on Kessel could feel the watch of a dark cosmic entity. The scars from the contact with Abeloth were not immediately evident, and it wasn't until 43 ABY that proof of something being wrong came to light. And I'm talking about the emergence of the Jedi Psychosis. One of the first victims was Valen Horn, son of famous Jedi Master Corrin Horn. When visiting his parents, Valen was struck by the overwhelming sensation, one that he couldn't even put into words or divine the nature slash origin of, that that his family had been replaced by imposters, that both his mother and father were not who they were pretending to be, replacements, with the true horns either killed or hidden away somewhere. Obviously, this brought forth immense stress, with Valen violently attacking his parents before attempting to flee. The exact same illness would befall his sister and almost every Jedi Knight who spent time at shelter as a youngling. The symptoms were pretty uniform. Even if the Jedi had advanced knowledge of the psychosis, almost out of nowhere a switch would be flipped, and the victim would start to believe in the conspiracy, usually that an alien race or some unknown entity has replaced everyone else, not only their family but just random people on the street, with an exact copy, and that they're next. Sometimes from then they will attempt to hide their knowledge of the conspiracy, but usually they react and with extreme violence, trying to both kill the perpetrators and discover the location of their friends and family. Fate of the Jedi actually has numerous first person perspectives of this happening where we actually see the Jedi develop the psychosis, and it's almost always the exact same. The first we see is Valen, who wakes up, realizes slowly something is wrong with his mother without being able to figure out what, then gets into a fight with his father, and there's absolutely no reason with the insane Jedi. They have a singular drive and can only be stopped with force. There's more though. When Valen was captured, he displayed strange abilities. Specifically, he could hide his brain activity from electroencephalus scans, which measured brain activity. This was a rare and strange force power that Jason Solo learned during his five year journey across the galaxy. Very similarly, Gisela Horn used flow walking, another extremely rare power, to protect herself while insane. Seth, Helen, and others also showed power far beyond their abilities. So why did Abeloth begin exercising her influence in 43 ABY? Well, most likely it was because the black hole sheath 
protecting her planet and thus limiting her influence, had finally opened far enough after the destruction of Centerpoint Station during the Second Galactic Civil War, so she could finally reach out and influence the corrupted Jedi. The psychotic breaks didn't all happen at the same time, there was time between each one, but the progression became quicker, likely because of Abeloth's growing power. Why though? Well, the insane Jedi see everyone as an imposter, except for other insane Jedi, and also Abeloth. Although most beings under her spell do not actually meet Abeloth, she is seen as a sort of truth, and more importantly, part of succumbing to the psychosis involves also succumbing to Abeloth's immense hunger and longing. Because she doesn't just use this technique, or this force mind power on the students of Shelter, but also on others who she had more direct contact with, like Dion's dad, or various members of the Lost Tribe of the Sith. Abeloth would either use them as pawns, or would suck their life energy using their body as an avatar. Others like the Mind Walkers of Sinkhole Station tried to trick Jason, Luke, and others well beyond shadows because they had been corrupted by Abeloth. Presumably, Abeloth's goal was to make her way out into the galaxy where she could call the Force Sensitives to her, then get more powerful off their life energy. And we also know specifically that she could get more powerful when she consumed Force Sensitives, so that makes sense. Unfortunately for her, she lost her influence over all Jedi, except for the Horn Children, after she was nearly killed by Luke Skywalker and the Lost Tribe of the Sith. When she was finally defeated, her influence was removed entirely, thus ending the threat of Force Psychosis and returning all Jedi to their healthy state. Before that, no other treatment had proven totally successful in ending the malady, though cutting the afflicted Jedi off from the Force did somewhat lessen their aggression. This was a major source of contention between the Jedi and Galactic Alliance Chief of State Natasi Dalla. Dalla wanted the GA to manage the treatment of the insane Jedi, which, in her opinion, could only be done by locking them in carbonite. The Jedi, including Jedi Doctor Master Silgal, sought more humane treatment options and aggressively hid and contained those affected within the temple. This obviously became extremely difficult both as more Jedi became insane and as the GA exerted more pressure on the Jedi. This culminated, ultimately, in attacks on the Jedi Temple, a raid on a Galactic Alliance prison to rescue the Horns, and eventually a Jedi coup which deposed Dala. Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another video. And we've got a fun one today because we're discussing a wacky yet also quite terrifying species from Star Wars Legends. A species which existed within the furthest reaches of even unknown space. And I'm talking of the Sea Rook. The Sea Rook were an aggressive race of, let's be honest, alien dinosaurs bent on galactic domination. And if you've never heard of the Sea Rook or the Sea Ruvi Imperium before, that's because when I say they're out there, I really mean it. If you check out this map, the Sea Ruvi Imperium actually exists outside of the borders of the galaxy and is arguably a part of extragalactic space. So let's talk about the Sea Rook. And before we continue, it might be useful to cover some naming conventions. And this is something I may mess up through the video, but it's still probably important to know. An individual member of the species is known as a sea ru. The species as a whole is known as sea rook. But if you're describing something related to the species, you use sea ruvi. So sea ruvi imperium, sea ruvi weapons, etc., etc. So the sea ru were a deadly enemy, not only because of their obvious physical stature and impressive physiology, but also their unique technology. The Sea Rook first appeared in the Truce at Pakura, where, in the days after the Battle of Endor, they attempt an invasion upon the rest of the galaxy. And it's really this book where we get our best look at how the Sea Rook operate, and the incredibly unique and interesting way that they fight wars. Unsurprisingly for such a warlike species in Star Wars, Sea Ruvi society was caste-based, based largely on genetics, including the color of one's skin and feathers. This is not unlike the Yuzhan Vong, and of course there was a warrior caste. With Red Sea Ru being the main warriors of the faction, but also supplemented by other rarer types, including Black Sea Rook, which were assassins. That being said, the entirety of Sea Ruvi society was dedicated to war, so even non-warrior factions would typically be involved in large-scale conflict. 
The Siruk were very, very religious and very xenophobic. They saw themselves as the supreme species within the galaxy, and that really influenced the way that they designed their technology and fought their wars. I mentioned specifically that Sea Ruvi technology is unique, and arguably the most unique aspect of that was integument. Sea Ruk used slaves, but not just ordinary slaves. They had a process known as integument. I've covered integument in several videos in the past because it is one of the most horrifying fates in Star Wars, but it's worth a brief mentioning here, of course. Integment was a process where the Sea Rook could steal a person's life essence and essentially use it to power a machine. A person's consciousness was maintained through integument and they were kept in a perpetual state of torture. Much, if not all, of C. Ruby technology was powered through integument, and I'm talking about everything from the light panels on a starship to even their droid controlled starfighters. This is what made C. Ruby warfare very interesting. Conquered planets became sources of new energy. And practically, the Sea Rook used a lot of automated technology, including the aforementioned droid starfighters. So it's sort of like an exponential threat. As the Sea Rook conquer a planet, they become more powerful. And if they can establish themselves within the unknown region, by the time they get to the core, although the species itself is not that large, they should have the ability to power and produce a lot of droids. And again, this is a fanatical xenophobic species, so they'll have no qualms about just absolutely devastating stating their enemies. Although their religion did provide a source for their fanaticism, it was also a weakness in war. One of the greatest fears for any Siru was their death over a non-consecrated world. The Siruk believed that if one of their soldiers died over a foreign planet which hadn't been properly transformed through religious practices, that their soul would cease to exist and would not pass on to the afterlife. This is one reason why the aggressive and wannabe expansionist faction kept to its little corner in the unknown regions. The risk of dying away from the home planet of Lewek or one of the other consecrated Sea Ruby systems was just too terrifying for a Sea Rook. The Sea Rook did make use of a smaller slave species known as the Puek, but evidently they didn't exist in great enough numbers to facilitate a large scale invasion, which is probably fortunate for the rest of the galaxy, especially the unknown regions. As I mentioned, not only were Sea Rook very frightening enemies from a technological standpoint, they were also very physically powerful. Powerful. And there wasn't much contact with the Sea Ruvi Imperium, which is the name of the Sea Ruvi Empire, throughout much of recorded history. However, by the Galactic Civil War era, the Imperium had made some contact outside of their cluster. They were abducting some pilots and other spacers for the purposes of integument, and eventually the Imperium made contact with Emperor Palpatine. Palpatine promised large swaths of space for Sea Ruby colonization in exchange for the sharing of technology. This is all covered very early on in the True Sapakura. Anyway, before this trade can be facilitated, Palpatine is killed at the Battle of Endor, and the Imperium choose to invade the galaxy anyway. This is where most of the plot of the Truce Apakura comes in. The Sea Ruby do successfully invade a few planets, but Apakura are turned back by a joint Imperial New Republic task force as led by Luke Skywalker. And Luke Skywalker has some really interesting perspective here when he's fighting the Sea Rook. When he kills one of the droid starfighters, he surprisingly feels a loss in the force because it's someone's soul essentially being freed but also destroyed. On the other hand, the Sea Rook are also using their own Jedi, Dev Subwara, who had been brainwashed into helping them find and in tech more humans. After the Sea Ruvi advance force is defeated by the New Republic, the Sea Ruvi push back to their own space, but are also attacked in later years by New Republic task forces. Now, we don't actually see much of this in direct novel form, but we do have references to campaigns against the Sea Rook in the Rogue Squadron novel. Although the Sea Rook, and especially their Intekman technology, would get some mention throughout other Star Wars Legends works, it wasn't really until the New Jedi Order, and specifically the Force Heretic duology, that they would appear again in a meaningful way. That saw a renewed Sea Ruvi Imperium attempt to start expansion again against Bakura, 
under, of course, the guise of peace, but it turned out that the Sea Rook had been infiltrated by the Yuzhan Vong, who had been manipulating galactic events not only throughout the war, but for the past couple of decades, and ultimately, Sea Ruvi expansion was unsuccessful. In fact, the Poek slave species actually manages to revolt and becomes the new de facto leader of the Imperium. So, we're talking today about five of the strangest, most bizarre, weird creatures in the Star Wars universe. Creatures beyond understanding, from other dimensions and more. We'll start today with the Rosum from the comic Blind Fury, and Blind Fury was actually written by famed comic book author Alan Moore, and yes, the same Alan Moore behind Watchmen. You can find the comic Blind Fury most easily within the classic Star Wars Devil Worlds collection, which itself is chock full of cool and weird stories. I should probably talk at some point about the Eternity Crystal, Dark Lord's Conscience, or other stories, but anyway, let's get back on topic. In Blind Fury, Luke has a vision of being overwhelmed by these grotesque and disgusting creatures. Strange creatures beyond understanding, which he eventually encounters within a mysterious temple. However, he's allowed to survive and is called forward towards the Hall of His Damnation. Luke eventually encounters a spirit claiming to be a high shaman of the terrible glare. And I'll leave it at that because you can read the rest to figure out the ending or maybe I'll cover it in a video. But the question is, what are these strange, almost Lovecraftian slithering entities that Luke encounters? These are known as the Rosum, and as we learn in the StarWars.com article, Barely Tolerable Alien Henchmen of the Empire, the Rosum were, and I quote, interdimensional monsters once allied with the bygone order of the terrible glare and more alien than anything any of the Imperial surveyors had ever seen. Unfortunately, we don't know a ton more. The Order of the Terrible Glare was sort of an offshoot of the Jedi Order. They did something to attract the attention of the Rosum, who traveled through dimensions into the Star Wars galaxy. Of course, the Rosum don't appear in much else, even within the Expanded Universe, but still the implications are very, very interesting. Speaking of Alan Moore, we also have two more entries from the famed author. Next up, we have the Bedlam Spirits, who are probably one of the more famous, obscure, weird Star Wars characters. The Bedlam Spirits appear in the comic Talotny Throws a Shape, and this is a very cool read. It makes you feel something that Star Wars comics don't usually, a sense of awe and wonder even at the strangeness of the galaxy. And that's always one of my favorite aspects of science fiction. Space is so large, but also so weird. And I love the idea that there are these far-flung places where things are happening beyond human understanding. Anyway, in Talotny Throws a Shape, we're introduced to the Bedlam Spirits, who live near a strange pulsar. These spirits, which can assume any form they want, seem to be all-knowing and probably all-powerful. However, they do work largely beyond the understanding of human minds. Their shapes seem randomly chosen to us, the reader, especially this one right here, but it's got some meaning in the form that just transcends our understanding. The Bedlam spirits seem freely capable of manipulating matter and even time itself. In the comic Leia, who's being pursued by the Empire, Crash lands on a planet which the spirits are inhabiting. They freely kill or distort stormtroopers until another one of them and puts them back together. Another stormtrooper is sent backwards through time so that Leia encounters his skeletal remains. The comic ends with Leia remarking that stranger things have probably happened in space but that she couldn't think of anything as the Bedlam spirits have now disappeared for some other realm. So we have beings that can freely manipulate matter and which sends stormtroopers back 8,000 years inhabiting a strange pulsar. Of course the Bedlam spirits aren't really mentioned very often in Star Wars lore, although they do get name dropped in Plagueis, which is pretty cool. Alright, so next up with our final Alan Moore story, we have Wetzek, who appears in the Pandora Effect. Now I'm just going to cover Wetzek very briefly, because I've done a deep dive into his story in a prior video all about the Hell Hoop, which I'll link above. But basically, when fleeing what Han calls Racketeers, the Millennium Falcon is chased into an area called the Hell Hoop, sort of like a Bermuda Triangle, a sector of space where no one seems to return from. Within the Hell Hoop, they encounter a massive starship, which ends up swallowing them whole, before folding into itself and disappearing. 
Within the spaceship, the group ends up encountering a being known as Wutzak, who is imprisoned within a force crystal. Wutzak is called by the person who captured him a force creature of unimaginable power. It's believed that long ago, his kind once owned the universe. Chewbacca, who looks fairly like a Sasquatch, later encounters the crystal, and when gazing upon it, is basically lost to time until he makes the decision to free Wutzak. Wutzak then goes in obliterates one of its captors, promising to torture them through eternity before allowing Han, Chewie, and Leia to escape. How frail your flesh, my tormentors, how transient, and now it is gone, only your souls survive within me forever. Wutzak ends up escaping and the crew thinks how lucky they are that he's loose within Imperial space. Of course, this isn't lore picked up in a later story, but it's still pretty fun. Okay, so next up we have another very famous weird species within the Star Wars Expanded Universe, and I'm talking of course about the one and only Waru from the infamous novel, The Crystal Star. The Crystal Star is thought by many to be one of the worst Star Wars Ex Expanded Universe novels, and I don't quite agree. It's not great, it's very, very weird, but there are definitely worse. The basic premise is that on this strange space station next to this crystal star, there's a being known as Waru. Waru appears to be healing people, but in actuality is only healing some and is sucking the energy from others, their force power. Waru is a being from another dimension, a dimension which is very different from the one we usually see in the Star Wars galaxy, one populated by what Luke calls anti-force. Anyway, to return Turn to his dimension, Waru needs to consume someone of adequate power, his eyes are set on Luke, and he does so by ingesting them within his gelatinous body. Waru is sort of described as a cubed mound of jelly covered in golden scales, with his viscous fluid sometimes leaking through, which Han actually calls Ikor on one occasion, which I found kind of funny. Anyway, throughout the novel, Waru is eventually able to return to his dimension, which later is called Other Space, a dimension that we've covered before on the channel. One species actually was trapped in Other Space known as the Charon, and it did some really nasty things to them, but I've covered that before. Look up Other Space and you'll find it. Finally, we have the Nal Nal, and I've covered the Nal Nal before, so I will just be very, very brief, and a link to the deep dive that I did up above. But the Nell now were a very disturbing creature, perhaps extra galactic, maybe even from Waru's dimension, that's sort of been my going theory. They were so destructive and so evil that it was hypothesized that the Celestials may have constructed a barrier in hyperspace, cutting them off from the rest of the galaxy. The Nell now were basically an ooze, an ooze which would enter a being, then consume their insides. The Nell now would then take control of this husk, basically as a puppet, with this oily fluid leaking out of their orifices, infecting others. But this wasn't just biological, this wasn't just some sort of being. The Nell now has a sentient, perhaps even godly quality to it. The Nell now has a mind, and it constantly whispers to its victims or potential victims, sharing secrets of the universe, whether they're true or false but also taking pleasure in pain and destruction, killing people just for fun, torturing people because it gets a laugh out of it. The Nell Nell's homeworld is on the planet of Mug Fallow, which was covered not only in the ooze, but artifacts of the galaxy's history, anything unlucky enough to encounter the being. The Sorcerers of Rand were first introduced in Luke Skywalker and the Shadows of Mindor. Now, this is sort of a weird book because it's not quite clear which parts of it are strictly true and which aren't. But regardless, the book is about Kronal, otherwise known as Black Hole, who I've covered in the past. Kronal was one of Palpatine's closest dark side advisors, and he worked very highly within Imperial intelligence. He was also raised among the Sorcerers of Rand, and here are a few things the book has to say about the group. Deep in the unknown region, there was a vast cloud of dust and rock and interstellar gas that pulsed with a bloody and forbidding scarlet glow as it radiated away the energy of 12 stellar clusters within. This was the Peron Nebula. The 12 clusters that it surrounded were known collectively as the Nile Retreat. The absolute rulers of the Nile Retreat, dreaded masters of dark magics beyond the grasp of even the Sith, were the Sorcerers of Rand. 
So the Sorcerers of Rand believed basically in the one truth, and the one truth stated that the only true power in the universe was the power to destroy, and that everything eventually would be destroyed. Civilizations would fall, even stars themselves would burn out. That's why they're sometimes described as worshipping entropy, and this general philosophy is known as the Way of the Dark. Now, although the Forcers of Rand certainly believed in elements of the dark side, they weren't necessarily strictly a force cult or anything like that. They didn't believe in the battle between light side and dark side, they simply believed that destruction and entropy were the only real powers within the universe. So Sorcerers of Rand dedicated themselves to destruction and they also used a power known as dark side. This seems quite similar to many other Jedi and Sith powers, basically it allows them to see the future and they believe that they can manipulate events to drive towards a specific branching outcome that they like to achieve. It was Kronal's gift with Darkseid which led him to the service of Palpatine, but it's really unclear to me just how different this is than the Force visions experienced by Luke Skywalker or Anakin or countless other Jedi and Sith. And this is where it seems somewhat like Shadows of Mindor is highly exaggerating things. The book suggests that Kronal essentially shaped the current state of the Star Wars galaxy. Palpatine thought that his predictions were just really accurate, but in fact, he was dictating the progression of things in the galaxy. Anyway, another key distinction between the Sith and the Randites or the Sorcerers of Rand was that they didn't believe that the dark side served them. They didn't attempt to harness dark side powers or bend it to their will. Rather, as we've been discussing, they believe that destruction is the ultimate goal and thus they sort of immerse themselves in the dark side and, if anything, serve it. So those are all basics from Matthew Stover's book, but we can also look to the Unknown Regions RPG guide for more actual and concrete knowledge about the Sorcerers of Rand. One thing that I found really interesting is that the Sorcerers themselves don't have any sort of unique appearance as a group. Rather they are in, and I quote, some type of disassembly or decay. One lacked skin and oozed bodily fluids with every step. One was merely a blackened skeleton. Another appeared to have been turned inside out with clean white teeth poking jaggedly from a raw mass of a head. A fourth existed as a long ribbon of flesh that swirled and coiled throughout the Randite receiving chamber. They don't seem to be made up of a single species or being. The true similarities are their presence within the Paran Nebula and their dedication to the dark. But let's talk a bit more about concrete information. We know that the Sorcerers of Rand are basically within this very small portion of space and they are almost impossible to reach, which is a good thing because their philosophy would be extremely tempting to any Darksider and their powers too could be very, very deadly. Although they don't care for the Jedi or the Sith then they don't really understand the Force as the rest of the galaxy would, the Sorcerers of Rand still employ Force powers. Aside from Dark Sight, they also use battle meditation and can even control lesser beings. Well, offensively, they can also attempt to channel the dark, which will cause their target to decay quite rapidly. For example, if they hit your heart, it might age 30 years in an instant. The source book also deals with history and explains that the sorcerers are really the joining of three ancient philosophical groups, each of these being, of course, a very extreme in their individual practices. One of them, the Nell of Mispili, for example, were trying to summon apocalyptic gods from the middle of space, which is, you know, not super cool. Over time, in their secluded parts of space, these groups would eventually join together, but to be honest, wouldn't ever have too much effect on the galaxy at large, despite for the emergence of Kronal. So put generally, the Sorcerers of Rand are not a very pleasant group. However, it's things like these that make me super interested in the unknown region. One of my favorite things about the expanded universes of Star Wars is the amount of time setting up a truly interesting galaxy. From the Outer Rim and the Galactic Arms and the Endless Space and even other galaxies beyond. The hyperspace routes blazed in the early days of the Republic which would set up the basics of galactic prosperity for several thousand years. To independent governments like the Hapes Consortium or the Psy Ruvi Imperium. To some of the most fascinating and dangerous places in the galaxy like 
the Deep Core. Now, I've done a few other videos on the Deep Core that you guys might be interested in, but today I wanna to focus primarily on its strategic significance and the associated dangers of the territory. So let's get started. As you might expect, the Deep Core rested in the center of the Star Wars galaxy. And in my opinion, it's one of the galaxy's strangest and least understood territories. So a lot of people expect the Deep Core to be the most important part of the galaxy. We know that core worlds like Coruscant and Corellia are centers of finance and art and industry, so you would expect even deeper towards the center of the galaxy to be even more important. At the very least, you would expect the Deep Core's proximity to planets like Coruscant to have led to massive colonization efforts just due to the mere proximity to these crucial worlds and the possibility for trade. However, in reality, the Deep Core is really not a nice place to be and that is why we don't see a lot of super important planets in that region or really a lot of time spent in the Deep Core. The new Ascent Atlas sums all of this up very, very well. It says despite its proximity to some of the oldest civilizations in the galaxy, Galaxy, much of the deep core remains unexplored. The primary reason for this is just the difficulty and danger of navigation. The center of the galaxy is a cluster of densely packed stars. And this basically extends throughout the entirety of the deep core. So yeah, it is the center of the galaxy, but not really in a helpful way. Because hyperspace is sort of like a shadow of real space, and safe hyperspace travel requires the absence of large gravitational bodies, it is very safe if not sometimes impossible to actually chart courses through the deep core. And even where courses have been established, slight miscalculations or malfunctions can easily lead to death. Any safe hyperspace routes that do exist need to be constantly re-navigated, and typically in Star Wars, ships would get this information from local stations. However, various factions have endeavored to keep the Deep Core secret or at least untraveled. There's also the fact that while the Deep Core does offer basically a route across the galaxy, the center of the region is not only difficult to explore, but also impossible. At a certain point, the stars are simply packed too closely together, and at the center of the galaxy is a massive black hole, making hyperspace travel simply not a thing. So basically the deep core is very very difficult to navigate and thus there isn't a lot of activity in that sector. Though there are a few major planets, the most notable ones certainly being Empress Teta. One final thing to note before we move on is that during the time of the Republic, colonization of the Deep Core just wasn't really desirable because there were more simple but equally prosperous places that you could reach within the ever-expanding borders of the Republic. So, where's the other half of this video? If the Deep Core is dangerous, then why is it so useful? And there's really two things here. First is the possibility for strongholds. Second is something that we kind of alluded to earlier, and that is the proximity to the core and the vital worlds of the galaxy. Remember, I said that hyperspace navigation was very, very difficult. However, it's not impossible. So, we know again from the new Essential Atlas that Emperor Palpatine, even during his time as Chancellor, made a concerted effort to actually explore the deep core using, for example, probe droids. Palpatine, the egomaniac that he was, was really big on manipulating space to accomplish his goals. We see not only the attempted mapping of the deep core, but also things like creating artificial hyperspace lanes using S boosters as he did with the sanctuary pipeline that led to Endor. Anyway, after early mapping successes, Palpatine fed information about the deep core and in particular one secret hyperspace route to the Separatists and they used that information to launch the attack on Coruscant. And this was really essential because the Battle of Coruscant was all about Palpatine making the citizens of the Republic feel vulnerable. In reality, Coruscant was well defended and would have been able to prepare for a traditional attack, but with Palpatine's manipulations, citizens felt like the war could come anywhere and that was just one step of Palpatine's further militarization. As we've discussed a few times in prior videos, secret hyperspace lanes were also key to the New Republic's victory at Ebak 9, which arguably changed the tide of the Yuzhan Vong War. 
If you want to learn more about the specifics of that, you can check out the video all I did about hyperspace travel and why you can't just go around blockades. So the other thing that makes the deep core, well, deeply important is the potential for high security. I mentioned that to travel in the deep core, you need constantly updated hyperspace maps, and that's true. In fact, they need to be updated as frequently as once a month beyond at least what was called the horizon. So on one hand, this is certainly a detriment because it means you need to constantly be keeping mapping information up to date. But on the other hand, this is a very, very easy way to keep people away from areas that you don't want visited. For example, the Empire under Palpatine heavily established a presence within the Deep Core. This allowed him to make various bases and secret facilities and just more plain things like factory worlds that couldn't be visited without Imperial authorization. Not only were there fleets surrounding the hyperspace lanes, but if you couldn't access Imperial data, you just couldn't get in. Even Han Solo sneaking past an Imperial fleet can't make up a hyperspace course that's going to work without the necessary data. And as I talked about in a prior video about factions exploring the galaxy, it's very, very difficult, especially as an individual, to actually blaze hyperspace routes. It's basically impossible, which is why Galactic to governments have typically been the only sources of new exploration in the galaxy. A lot of it is literally sending ships and people out through trial and error until you find a way that works. So the Empire found all these new and inaccessible high security worlds in the deep core and Palpatine did something that was very smart. He had them inhabited by his most loyal supporters. Essentially he made a redoubt should the Empire fall. And this is almost like what happened as well with the Empire of the Hand. Palpatine always had redundancies. Within the deep core was Palpatine's most secured world, Biss. Not only was that in a very inaccessible zone, protected by his fleets and of course inhabited by by his most loyal supporters, but this run, which was the only way to actually get to the planet, was actually an artificial hyperspace lane, kept open only by S-boosters. This housed not only the Emperor's Citadel and Palpatine's cloning chambers, but also secret construction yards, which made ships like the Eclipse 2 Dreadnought and the Galaxy Gun. And even after Palpatine's death, the Deep Core remained a hotbed of Imperial activity. For a while, really, the Deep Core was the only place in the galaxy where a strong Imperial presence remained. This was after the infighting of the Warlords and Thrawn's campaign and Operation Shadow Hand. It was really Deep Core Warlords like Sander Del Vardis and Blitzer Harsk who had a lot of the remaining power in the galaxy or at least the remaining Imperial power. The New Republic would have had a very very hard time actually getting the Empire out of the Deep Core and there remained some secrets and including some Super Star Destroyers which had gone unclaimed, most notably the Megador. However, the Empire's spread and their prosperity was also severely limited, which is why Pelion chose to move the Empire into the Outer Rim. There's a lot of nasty stuff hiding out there between the stars. Forgotten fleets, gigantic monsters, black holes. But few things inspire fear like the unexplainable, the things that go bump in the night. And in the Star Wars universe, there are unexplainable sentient entities which will go out of their way to prey on living beings. We'll discuss star weirds, space wraiths, and more. Let's not waste any time and get right into the profile of the first species we'll be looking at on today's video. Space Wraiths, a creation of the Ultimate Adversaries RPG Guide. Space Wraiths are strange beings, not totally tethered to one dimension and skirting the line between the real world and the spirit world beyond. Ultimate Adversaries describes them as shadowy, insubstantial beings which float through space in a state of hibernation until a sentient being comes near them. Upon encountering such an individual, they forcefully enter their mind and force the being to act in a way contrary to their normal inclinations. The guide describes examples where a technician would sabotage his machinery, soldiers turning against their allies, and force users falling to the dark side. However, much like the demonic entities of pop culture, the possession of a space wraith, at least in its early stages, is usually subtle until full control can be achieved. Now, it's unclear what exactly these beings are, and some do believe that they're simply a species within the galaxy, while others argue that they're the spirit of dead force users gone to the dark side who could not reach the afterlife. Regardless, because the degree to which they use the dark side of the force, and they do during and after possession, it's clear that they're either a manifestation of
of, or a tool of, the dark side. They're also singularly minded, with simply the goal of evil. However, their actions do seem to be much more restrained and nuanced than, for example, the Nal Nal, which I've discussed many times in earlier videos. Notably, space wraiths can possess an individual simply by touching them, and apparently the only resistance is an extremely strong will. They typically inhabit hyperlanes and can pass through ships and other solid objects like shields or armor to attack their victims. They move completely silently and, while in ghost form, are extremely intelligent and stealthy. A fully wraith-bound creature typically will seek out to kill all of those around them, and if they have the power of the force, they will use the dark side without hesitation. Next, let's talk about Star Weirds, another creation of the Ultimate Adversaries Guide. Like Space Wraiths, Star Weirds were found only in deep space. However, they seem to be a bit more off the beaten path. Rather than inhabiting hyperlanes, they more or less kept to themselves. That is, until someone is unlucky enough to run across them. When this happens, the guide says the victim sees an impossibly tall humanoid, so gaunt as to be nearly skeletal, with long, white hair floating around its head, even within artificial gravity. It wears rags that hang in strips from its bony arms, and when you look at the face of the Star Weird, it's said to resemble, at least somewhat, your own. However, with a large mouth full of sharp teeth and an eerie glow behind the eyes. And that is a somewhat altered quote from the book. Unlike wraiths, Star Weirds do not possess a victim. Rather, they simply attack them, usually with their claws or a scream which can be heard even in the middle of space. For some reason, they focus especially on Force users, leaving some to believe that they could be a manifestation of the dark side. Regardless of their target, space wraiths will not stop pursuit until either they or their victim are killed. However, it's unknown how you actually destroy a space wraith, likely through the light side of the force. How exactly non-force sensitive targets are selected is unknown, but it is believed that star weirds may feed on the life force of living beings. Notably, aside from their scream, star weirds could use other powers, including force lightning. So interestingly, these two beings are certainly not the only recorded instances of ghosts or weird entities in Star Wars, far from it in fact. Obviously, we have the light side force apparitions of dead Jedi, but in Legends at least, force ghosts of dark side users could also return with a malevolent intent. Some, like Exar Kun, would even go on to possess living beings. We also have unknowns, like the Vision, or perhaps Thing, that appeared before Luke on Dagobah, or Sith Beasts, or Sith Magic, which sort of straddles the line between an actual creation of the dark side itself and the manipulation of a living being. Add to that Abeloth, who was known to use her own will and the Force to inhabit bodies violently, and others like the Nal Nal, and it's very clear that deep space in the Star Wars universe is very dangerous, and also that there certainly is at least some form of life after death. Theoretically, nanoviruses in Star Wars require only one thing. For the victim to be infected by some sort of very small machine, then transformed into a cybernetic husk, while losing at least some form of bodily autonomy. Practically, however, nanotech in Star Wars is not very advanced or widespread. The best example of traditional nanotechnology I can think of is the Fizz. Nanotechnology which presented as organic acid, but which actually could target threats to whichever planet it resided on. The Fizz is described by Master Silgal as being advanced far beyond the technologies of the Galactic Alliance. Because of this, practical application of a nanovirus almost always, if not always, required use of the dark side of the force. This brings us to Sith Techno Beasts. And let's turn to the new essential guide of droids, which sums up the terrifying creatures. I've condensed some of the information for you. Techno beasts are true Sith abominations. Their very existence is proof of the evils perpetuated during the new Sith Wars, when dark side magicians strove to pervert the balance of the Force. The Sith developed the ability Mekuduru to allow for Force control over mechanical systems. Sith Lord Belaya Darzu delved deeper creating technology that hungered, the Technovirus Seed. The entry explains that those infected with the Technovirus Seed would essentially have their organic matter turned into circuitry, 
What's truly terrifying is that what started out as a small spore upon touch would quickly transform organic tissue into machinery, growing into the size of a fist-shaped tumor in minutes as the virus moved through veins, replacing them with electronics as the virus eventually lobotomized the host. At this point, of course, the Technovirus had full control over the victim, thus creating a Technobeast. And the key of the Technobeast is a combination of the mastery of Sith Mechaduru, technology control, and a propagating virus, itself powered by the dark side of the force. Together, the technique of creating the Technovirus seed and controlling Technobeasts themselves was known as Mechaduru Vitae. Post lobotomy, Technobeasts would replace limbs with pincers, saws, and blades, while also covering their flesh with armor and growing weapons like blasters, essentially turning them into zombie cyborgs. And at this point, I should note that it wasn't only humans or humanoids that could be transformed, but even larger creatures. And theoretically, at least, there's no max size, so just imagine a Technobeast Exogorth. Spores, or at least presumably those created by a single Sith, were somehow linked to each other, giving the beasts a form of group consciousness. And once an individual was infected, the spore not only reproduced for the purpose of control, but also further disease propagation. An infected Technobeast would produce new seeds which could be released in spore form, infecting any within range. So if you could somehow move the spore to a civilized planet, you would have an ever-expanding totally subservient army under your control. And once the disease had progressed to the point of total control, it was irreversible, and the only way to prevent a full infection upon exposure was the use of certain intravenous chemicals, as was the case with Darth Bane, or the use of the Force. So, as I alluded to earlier, an army of Technobeasts could be tied to the will of the person who created the seed. Bane discovered, hundreds of years after their creator's death, that an army of Technobeasts, which had previously been used to wage a war, still remained, even after the death of their creators. They weren't, however, in the best of state, with, I quote, most of their living tissue having since rotted and fallen away. What remained were desecrated strands of skin and sinew clinging to bone supported and held together by rods, wires, and twisted scraps of metal. What remained of their brains had been kept alive by the nanogenes of the Technovirus, but the inevitable long-term degradation had impaired their motor skills and reduced them to shells of shambling, mummified metal. And this, to me, is one of the most terrifying aspects of the Technobeast. After infection, it's not really clear what happens to you your consciousness. The techno beast destroys your frontal lobes, but the rest of your brain should remain intact and it seems like the machine or the cyborg that you become actually somewhere lies on your brain to function. Still, you're under the control of a dark sider and will typically be thrown into battle or perhaps just left to shamble along for eternity. Still, even in their poor state, where the Technobeasts were essentially powerless shells, the army still took over an hour for Bane to destroy, and on a few occasions actually threatened the Sith Lord. Ultimately though, Technobeasts were just one expression of Sith Spawn, a technique which saw beings warped by the dark side, ultimately to serve a Sith Master at the cost of their autonomy. Similarly, they were only one expression of Mecha Duru. Many Sith, like Kronal, focused on furthering his skills in other areas of the technique, especially in machine control. There are also, of course, many other disturbing technologies in Star Wars Legends. One of the better known ones is Entechment, which basically uses a being's life force for energy to power a machine. But to me at least, the body horror of becoming a techno beast puts it up to the number one slot. The hyperdrive is the most useful piece of technology in the Star Wars galaxy. It brings distant stars and people together, allowing the formation of a pan-galactic society. However, travel through hyperspace is certainly not without its dangers. Besides for the mundane issues of running into a black hole or having your engine fail and being stranded in the middle of nothing, there are also weirder dangers. Today, we'll do a deep dive on the phenomenon known as hyperspace madness. Although countless works have shown people staring off into hyperspace without any sort of trouble, the Death Star novel discusses a supposed mental condition known as hyperrapture. 
Here's the quote. Darth Vader stood on the bridge of his warship, staring out the forward viewport, at the kaleidoscopic chaos of hyperspace. The effect was akin to tumbling down an endless tunnel of amorphous whirling patterns of light, starlight and nebula, smeared into impressionistic blotches by the ship's superluminal speed. He knew that even experienced spacers and Navy personnel often hesitated to look at it. Standard operating procedure was to keep the thick slabs of transparent steel opaque while traveling through the higher dimensional universe. There was something profoundly wrong about hyperspace, composed as it was of more than the three spatial and one temporal dimensions that most sentient species were used to. Looking too long into hyperspace promised madness, so the stories went. He had never heard of anyone actually succumbing to hyper rapture, as it was called. Nevertheless, the legends persisted. Vader enjoyed staring into it. In a companion quote from the shadows of Mindor, we have the following. Chronal loved gazing into hyperspace, the nothingness outside the universe, the place beyond even the concept of place. Ordinary mortals sometimes went mad, succumbing to the delirium of hyper rapture from gazing too long into the emptiness. Chronal found it soothing, a glimpse into the oblivion beyond the edge of things. On a lighter note, Kedrin from the novel Cross Current at one point wonders whether he's looked through too many ship viewports during hyperspace and went mad. So let's evaluate what we've just read and see how it fits into the greater Star Wars universe. Obviously, hyperspace madness or hyper rapture isn't a very well fleshed out or understood phenomenon, even from within the Star Wars universe, and that's if it even exists. However, we do know that the dimension of hyperspace itself is extraordinarily strange. As explained in the above quotes, it's a realm different from real space, yet somehow related. No one really understands how hyperdrives work and how ships can actually travel through hyperspace. Just again that the two dimensions are somehow connected, and that travel through hyperspace allows one to move vast distances in short periods of time. The Force Unleashed 2 novelization, funny enough, actually touches on these points well. It talks about the weirdness of hyperspace, the impossibility of the realm, the angles which shouldn't exist, the disorientation, the paradoxical light, and the swirling madness. What's more, we know that related to hyperspace is other space, often described as a pocket dimension. I've done a whole video on other space, but we know that that realm can certainly drive species insane, as was the case with the Charon, who accidentally landed there after a hyperdrive malfunction. They turned violent and dark, and tried to wage war on the galaxy after escaping. In an unreleased legend story, Supernatural Encounters in the Star Wars universe, other space would have been home to Lovecraftian creatures, banished there by the architects of the galaxy. Here's a quote that describes the creatures that the protagonist encountered while in other space. Then it started to grow, to spiral and fall inwards, turning inky as it spun in sulfurous swirls. From out of the vortex, the ruinous avatars of my darkest vision stormed into view, three floating cyclopean shapes of grasping tentacled arms that swarm out from underneath a cube of iridescent gilded shields. They were followed by an array of tremendous revolting annelids wearing absurd faces like the ceremonial dust masks of the Hendian. So other space being at least closely related to hyperspace, with the latter perhaps a gateway between other space and real space, adds to the mystery and bizarre nature of hyperspace travel. In canon, we also have stories of those attempting travel outside the galaxy falling into insanity due to the overwhelming void. It's not the same but the madness of hyperspace seems to have an element related not only to the unexplainable nature of the dimension, but also the vast nothingness. Whether hyperrapture is actually a thing or not, it certainly fits in well with some standard motifs in science fiction. As is the case with Warhammer, faster than light travel typically takes place in a dimension that's unknown and usually weird and scary. If it does exist, I feel really bad for Nil Spar, leader of the Duskon League, who, as punishment for the crimes of the Yavathan, is put into an escape pod and launched in the middle of hyperspace and left to drift and starve. The final few days of his life will be very, very scary. Still, despite all this, we never actually see someone inflicted with the condition, and people seem to have no qualms with looking out viewports while traveling, though perhaps it's the call from the abyss, one actually staring deep and losing themselves in the void that causes hyperspace madness. 
The Crystal Star is one of the most frequently derided books in Star Wars The Legends history, yet it actually has a special place in my heart. It's terrible, but I just love how weird it is. The Crystal Star features Waru, a being from another dimension, who wants nothing more than to return home. He was basically a large liquid mass covered in scales, and he could change his size wildly. He purported to be a healer, and would allow people to swim inside of him. However, as our heroes learn, at the end of the story, he had a much more nefarious purpose. The creature's circulation whirlpooled around a central point of darkness. It looked like a black hole and its accretion disk. Han wondered, could the black hole open a portal to another universe? Is that where Waru came from? And we learned that Waru could only return home by consuming beings. However, not just ordinary people, they had to be beings with incredible force power. Luke, leave him to me, Waru said. Leave him, and I will free you. No, Leia cried. Give him back to us. Why do you want him? He can help me return to my home. Oru's voice softened. Won't you help me? You know what it is to miss your home. I can see that I've been away so very long. Oru's voice was so sad that Leia let herself drift closer, deeper. How can we help you? Leia, Han tried to draw her back. Don't listen. His power can help me open a portal. That's a quote directly from the book, which explains how Waru tried to consume Luke, and perhaps even Leia, in order to collect enough power to leave the dimension. How does this all work? Well, Waru apparently acquires energy to power his portal through the use of the Anti-Force. Another quote. What did it want from us? Leia asked. Waru whispered to my brother, she thought, and told him, tempted him. It was stranded, Luke said. His gaze was haunted. It could only gain energy by annihilating the force of our universe with the anti-force of its own. Waru needed enough power to rip a path through space-time back to its own universe, like an electron and a positron, bring them together, and he clapped his hands together. Annihilation. Unimaginable energy. He closed his eyes. Hithrir thought he'd be able to tap into that power, and for a moment, so did I. The domain from which Waru comes is apparently a polar opposite of the Star Wars dimension, including the Anti-Force, Luke's name for the power that governs that universe. So in a sense, Waru wasn't actually using the Force or destroying the Force to return home. Rather, it seemed to be the immense energy created by bringing the Anti-Force and the Force together in a single place. Waru's powers called out to Jedi across the galaxy, and he also used his powers as a healer to further attract visitors. So how does this fit into the greater Star Wars Legends continuity? Well, it doesn't really. At least unless you take a closer look at the cancelled but unofficially released novella Supernatural Encounters of the Star Wars Universe, which we've brought up a few times over the past few videos. This work brings together several Legends concepts and creates basically a singular pocket dimension within the Star Wars Universe. I've taken a few quotes and sort of jammed them together in a way that tells the whole story. Shortly after they'd first arrived, Talotni, Splendid App, and Cold Danda Sign created a hidden realm within and beyond the galaxy in which they would not easily be discovered. It was the dimension later referred to as Other Space, a dreamlike, surrealistic pocket dimension hidden behind real space. The gloomy, charcoaled canopy universe was touched with hints of a deep red glow, pinprick black stars, supernovas, and other rare celestial phenomenon that were scattered amongst the fewer standard variety suns, lending the dimension a truly alien feel. Though some came to call it Muspili, the Realm of Fire, and others the Anti-Force, it was named Ilatherion in a long forgotten language, which meant Veiled Fortress, beyond the reach of real space and the walls of hyperspace, and occluded by powerful spells, Cold Danda Sign had envisioned contumacious new things to excite him, so that it became, over time, an even weirder and more hideous domain, forged in mockery of the galaxy. So, Waru's realm, and the anti-force within it, is the same as Other Space, which we've been recently talking about, and was basically somewhere for Cold Dan Design, one of the four extraordinarily powerful Bedlam spirits, to experiment. Upon a journey to Other Space in the novella, Waru and creatures like him are encountered by the protagonist. Now of course, none of this is canon, and of course Star Wars Legends ended before this novella could be officially released, but it's interesting. Other Space is often described as the opposite of regular space, so having the anti-force within really makes sense. Having Waru and other strange and horrific creatures living there also helps explain why the Charon seemingly went mad.
Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another video. And today we'll be discussing one of the creepiest creatures that I've ever seen from Star Wars. A creature with no real backstory whose existence is, well, almost totally unexplainable. And this creature actually comes from one of my favorite classic childhood games, Star Wars Racer, the pod racing game. Now, as a kid, I always played this game for the N64. I played it a ton, but last night I actually returned to it and played it for the first time on PC. Now, just like Shadows of the Empire, Star Wars Pod Racer or Star Wars Racer for PC actually has some differences, including better music and notably additional cutscenes. And it's these cutscenes here that led to, well, something very, very strange. I'm going to play a clip of this stream where I lay my eyes on this disturbing monster for the first time. Unfortunately, because I am playing on a system far beyond what the game was originally designed for, the cutscene is a little bit small, but don't worry, I'll provide some some better footage later. That thing, that's super creepy. So yeah, what is that thing? Because it is super creepy. And it's even weirder because all of the other track intros in the game actually have a commentary track from a narrator over them. But Malastair, which is the track with the demon, and all of the Malastair tracks have this intro, I believe, is just completely silent. So it's very, very strange. All right, so seeing this last night, I was thinking about it for a while, and I knew that the game's got an HD release from Aspire on Xbox and PS4 and switch so I looked up some more gameplay to see if I could get a better look at this creature and a user known as Overhazard and I'll link to their video down below posted a very clean and clear intro to the video and we get a better look at this thing and it's even more disturbing in high definition it's like a skeleton almost a dog shape or a horse shape it looks somewhat organic but also somewhat metallic and the weirdest part for me is like it's distended stomach which is much much larger than the rest of its body not really just its stomach its stomach and its chest it's very very weird and that part leads me to believe that it was at least at one point alive of course it's got those really creepy red eyes and yeah we see it wave on the beginning of the race all in all very very creepy and no context given in the game i checked the star wars wikipedia page for appearances under the game and i couldn't find any creatures matching this description i checked the individual races i couldn't even remember at first that it was mal I wasn't sure if it was something related to a single track, but eventually my research did lead me to the right place, and I discovered that this creature's name is Nug Tosh, N-U-G-T-O-S-H, and yeah, I've never heard of him either. Very, very strange. So we get a little more information about Nug Tosh on that Wikipedia page specifically that he does have an entry in the Star Wars Encyclopedia. Of course he does. That thing is incredibly dense and very detailed. Thankfully I have that so I can read you guys the excerpt. It says... This grotesque, skeletal alien presided over the annual Vinta Harvest Classic Pod Race on Malastare during an era of the Battle of Naboo. He was a vagrant, but was considered good luck by the pod racers and fans. So this has him basically as just some sort of weird looking alien. I guess he lives on Malastare or he showed up on Malastare. Vagrant basically means that he's kind of a wanderer, so presumably not from Malastare initially, but who knows. However, Nugtosh also has an appearance in the Star Wars Republic comic series. Thankfully, I do have access to these as well. Unfortunately, his appearance is very, very limited. There's a pod race at Malastare, and all we get is this one frame of Nugtosh looking actually quite different than from the game. With a quote saying, true to long-standing tradition, Nugtosh has taken his position at the starting line. Other than that, I did learn that there was a reference to Nugtosh in the Prima strategy guide for the game. Unfortunately, I was not able to get my hands on the guide. However, someone on the Star Wars wiki did paste what they call an excerpt. Now, I can't confirm it, but I find it very unlikely that it would be false. Anyway, according to user Savage from 2013, page 35 says, Malastare's host is a curious creature, living a depraved life on the surface of this intoxicating planet, breathing methane-like air. Nugtosh allows pilot to compete on the abandoned courses, promising that if it gets to make an appearance at the beginning of each race, it won't sabotage the track. 
No one knows where the creature comes from, how old it is, or whether it's male or female. A true enigma, its survival alone proves it's not one to be crossed. Out of respect for this, everyone accepts Nug Tosh's appearance as a permanent adjunct to any race held on Malice. Now, I actually do have a copy of the strategy guide at my parents' house that I can check next time I go there once I get my COVID vaccine. So I'll post on Twitter if I can confirm that this is true, but it seems to be. There is a bit of a discrepancy there, of course. It gives extra lore to Nug Tosh, but we also have the Star Wars Encyclopedia saying explicitly that it's male. And I mean, our strategy guide's canon. It is an official strategy guide licensed by Nintendo to Prima, but it's at best just a very quasi low level of canon and not much more than that. But certainly where it seems to have been overwritten by the Star Wars Encyclopedia, again, not really canon. I do like the story that they present, and that's one that's kind of canon to me. Basically, the creature has been living on Malastare, which we know to be a toxic planet and has been warped. Today, we are looking at five very dangerous places within the Star Wars galaxy. Today's list will be a little bit different than usual, the five entries aren't ranked in any sort of order, and I've tried to pick five locations which are dangerous for various reasons in order to give a good amount of variety to the list. Starting off, we have the Maw, and this entry is especially relevant given the fact that the new Han Solo movie may feature the Kessel Run, which in Star Wars Legends at least, required navigation of the Maw Cluster. The Maw was a series of black holes within the Kessel Sector. It was very, very dangerous for a variety of reasons. From an astro-navigational point of view, it was almost impossible to navigate the Maw. The gravity produced by the black holes made hyperspace travel impossible, so any wannabe Maw travelers had to go through real space. However, the Maw was also littered with asteroids and other debris. It was very hard to see, and often sensors didn't work, hence the danger. However, it was more than just navigation which was deadly in this sector. Due to the presence of Kessel, the area was filled with smugglers, pirates, and other people that you generally want to avoid. Within the Maw itself, there was also a secret Imperial research facility known as Maw Installation. Throughout the Galactic Civil War, Admiral Dalla commanded a fleet of several Star Destroyers stationed within the Maw, and as Han Solo found out, they were actually stationed in one of the only safe spots. Perhaps most dangerously, the entity known as Abeloth was trapped within the center of the Maw Cluster. Sinkhole Station was also in the region, and any travelers unfortunate enough to find themselves there would often be contacted by Abeloth, especially if they had any sort of force sensitivity. All in all, the Maw is filled with countless dangers, and really should be avoided at all costs. At number 2 we have the Edge of the Galaxy. In Star Wars, the further you get away from the galactic core, the less civilized things become. First off, we have the Unknown Region, a haven not only for standard criminals and smugglers and slavers, but also home to various dangerous races, including the Vagari, the Cyruk, and if you piss them off, the Chiss. The Unknown Regions are generally unexplored, there's no information written down about them, so if you go there, you really have no idea what you're in store for. However, where things really get deadly is as you pass through the Unknown Regions and come close to the Intergalactic Void. There, you run the chance of running into the hyperspace anomaly that borders the edge of the galaxy. It's described as some sort of turbulence traveled not only through hyperspace, but also real space is likely impossible, and given the void between galaxies, travel through real space isn't practical either. Basically, the further away you get from the center of the galaxy, the less friendly faces you see, the more enemies there are, and just generally, you're gonna run into some weird stuff. Between the outbound flight and the various other explorers who have tried to leave the galaxy, it's just generally not a good idea. At number 3 we have the Hell Hoop, a location which I've actually covered in some previous videos. For many years the Hell Hoop sort of acted like the Bermuda Triangle of the Star Wars galaxy. Ships would enter and they would almost never be seen again, even Han Solo only entered because he had absolutely no other option. Until sometime after the Battle of Yavin, this is because a group known as the Fives in possession of a mysterious starship were capturing unwitting victims, torturing them, and eventually killing them. However, things actually get worse after Han and Leia run into them because they release an ancient being with seemingly unlimited power and a desire to inflict pain. So either you run into this group with a mystical starship that can appear out of thin air who tortures you and kills you, or you're killed by an all-seeing, all-powerful demon. Make your choice. At number 4 we have the Deep Core, which is one of the weirdest parts of the Star Wars galaxy, and also one of my favorites. At the center of the Star Wars galaxy is a supermassive black hole. Unsurprisingly, the Deep Core is the area around this phenomenon. 
Space is very strange here, there's a lot of matter compacted into a very small area. Gravity is very weird, hyperspace travel is almost impossible, and just navigation and things like the passage of time gets pretty weird. There's also dark matter and antimatter, both things which can be dangerous within the Star Wars universe. However, what made the Deep Core truly deadly, in my opinion, was the concentration of the Empire and the dark side. Palpatine established countless fortress worlds like Biss and Prakith, which were so well defended that they would hold out successfully against the New Republic for dozens of years. Many of these planets were also centers for the dark side. Palpatine, for example, left a huge mark on the planet Biss, which corrupted not only the planet, but also those around it. Biss was also home to secret weapons projects, a gigantic imperial fleet, the cloning facilities for Emperor Palpatine, and, with the reborn Emperor, acted as the staging ground for his attack on the rest of the galaxy. Finally, we have the planet of Korriban, but I also just generally want to include dark side nexuses and four strong locations. Depending on the time when you visit the planet, as a traveler to Korriban, you're either going to run into a hiding cult of dark Jedi, a Sith Academy, the reborn Sith, or a myriad of other things. If the planet's not populated, then you also have to deal with the countless tombs and dark side artifacts and just the general presence of the force that permeates the planet. There's a reason that most good Sith like Darth Kytus or Krayt make a stop on the planet Korriban. There's so much power there. However, there are many other locations like this throughout the galaxy, including the Cloak of the Sith, places very strong on the dark side where dark side practitioners often flock to. It's best to avoid these regions because not only are you at risk for succumbing to the dark side of the force, but you really don't want to run into anyone who stays there by choice. What happens if you get stuck in hyperspace? And I'm just going to expand that more broadly to ask what happens if your hyperdrive fails or if your hyperspace jump is unsuccessful. For those who don't know, hyperspace in Star Wars is a different dimension. It allows starships to travel vast distances within a relatively short period of time. It's one of several dimensions in Star Wars. Other dimensions include other space, and perhaps also the dimension that Waru comes from, and Waru is an interdimensional creature featured in the novel The Crystal Star. And on that point, before I get on to the topic, I was reading the excellent Despoilers of an Empire article on Star StarWars.com, which was an old Legends piece about Imperial Warlords, and Part 3 actually makes reference to the Anti-Force being in other space. The Anti-Force is big in Waru's story, and kind of suggests that Waru's universe and other space are actually one in the same, and I'll talk about that perhaps later or in another video. But it's the whole strangeness of other space which really offers this danger. It's not as bad as, say, the warp from Warhammer 40,000, but there is still the serious possibility of being trapped. The first way is pretty simple, and actually is legend specific. In Star Wars canon, if you're in a spaceship, and somehow leave that spaceship which is traveling through hyperspace, you simply revert to real space. However, in Star Wars Legends, if you're in hyperspace and eject in a non-hyperspace capable vehicle, you basically get stuck in hyperspace forever. So imagine a Star Destroyer launches a TIE in hyperspace. That vessel will now be stuck in hyperspace for eternity, with no engine to return it to real space. I've mentioned this in a prior video, but Neil Spar, who led the Avathan Duskon League, was punished at the end of the Black Fleet Crisis for his crimes against the galaxy, basically by being shuttled into hyperspace and left to go insane and die. And the thing is, it wasn't always people who were thrown into hyperspace or forced into hyperspace without an engine. Sometimes ships would have malfunctions that could result in either being ejected to real space, which could be really crappy in its own right because it means you're literally in the middle of nowhere. We saw that happen to, for example, Luke Skywalker in the Thrawn trilogy. And it was okay for him because he's a Jedi, so he had certain techniques which he could use to slow down his breathing and basically allow himself to survive and maintain the ship's supply of oxygen and whatnot. 
but for many others, if you're knocked out of hyperspace, that's certain, certain death. I mean, the Star Wars movies don't really show this, but the galaxy is extraordinarily large, and the space between planets is, well, astronomical. It's really not practical to fly on sublight drives between systems, so you'll have to drop some sort of navigational buoy and hope for the best. However, also there's a chance that maybe your hyperdrive breaks and sends you into the middle of a star or a planet. That is probably what happened to the Praetor-class battlecruiser, the Questor, which had a hyperdrive failure, propelling it into a planet which it proceeded to destroy alongside itself, of course. Alright, so if your hyperdrive breaks, we've covered three things that can happen so far. You get stuck in hyperspace, you get stuck in real space, and probably the middle of nowhere when you just look at the size of the galaxy galaxy and the proportion of it that's populated, or you crash into a planet, or another stellar body, or some sort of black hole, and you die an instant and comparably merciful death. However, is that all that can happen? Well, no. We've spoken already of other space, and I've mentioned it in prior videos, so some of you probably know what it is. However, other space is a third dimension, somewhat aside real space in hyperspace, that seems to be an inverted version of reality. The sky looks the exact opposite as it does in regular space. There's something called the anti-force there, most likely. Waru probably lives there. And if you have a hyperdrive, malfunction, so could you. The other Space West End games books have a pretty cool story about rebel ships getting stuck in the other dimension after a hyperdrive malfunction, and how the violent race known as the Charon want to escape. But I think I've covered that all sufficiently in the past, and I'll try to link to one of my prior videos in the upper right hand corner. The West End Games source books of that era especially are more fun than really concrete lore or anything, but I still think Other Space has been integrated enough in later continuity that it deserves a mention in this video. Similarly, aside from being sent to another dimension, you can also be sent even outside of the Star Wars galaxy, as was the case with Luke and Leia in issue 38 of the original Star Wars run, where they're basically sent to the intergalactic void, an even worse place to be than just stranded in the middle of the galaxy. But there are even worse things that can happen due to hyperspace malfunctions or hyperspace weirdness. The Sith capital ship Harbinger made a jump with a malfunctioning hyperdrive and ended up 5,000 years into the future. Something similar, albeit on a much smaller scale, happened to R2-D2 and C-3PO in the Star Wars droids comics as they went from before the Battle of Yavin to the time of Return of the Jedi after a hyperdrive malfunction caused by weapons damage. But presumably that would be pretty rare and would only happen to you if you were in a bit of a wackier uh, Star Wars story. We've got a pretty fun topic today because we're covering a story that I think most of you probably have not read, and it details the Rebel Alliance's base within another galaxy, and if you're wondering, well, I didn't even know there were other galaxies in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, there are many. There are several companions, smaller orbiting galaxies, to the main Star Wars galaxy, the galaxy far, far away as it's often called, but there were others as well, the Yuzhan Vong galaxy, for example. I've covered a lot of this in a prior video. Video, so if you're interested, I'll link to you in the upper right hand corner. The lore we'll be discussing today comes from Maze Run, an exclusive short story within Star Wars Insider 131. Now I'm actually lucky enough to have my hands on Star Wars Insider 131, so I thought it'd be fun to share it with you guys. The location for this galaxy is the Rishi Maze. The Rishi Maze is one of those companion galaxies to the galaxy far, far away. Actually the closest companion galaxy, which is why it's sometimes called Companion Oric or Companion A. The Rishi Maze is also close to Kamino, and you can actually see it on an official map within Attack of the Clones itself, which is pretty cool. Now, I don't have a whole lot of other footage for this episode, so instead I'm going to play you guys some Star Wars Squadrons gameplay I captured before recording, but if you're just interested in the lore, maybe tune that out and just listen to my voice and do something else. So, this story takes place before Han formally joined the Rebel Alliance. He was still an independent smuggler, taking on on dangerous missions. The Alliance had an energy processing base set up in the Rishi Maze. 
meant to be, of course, far away from Imperial eyes. The base was very short on supplies, everything from shielding to power generators, so Han was contracted for the very dangerous task of running the Rishi maze and delivering supplies. Why so dangerous? Well, because Rishi is a small galaxy and the center of the Rishi maze is a supermassive black hole, Han says there are huge jets of relativistic plasma, vast fields of gravitation, energy, and debris on all sides. And this is why the maze is called the maze. It's a labyrinth of death. The short story says that the ordinary hyperspace trade lane, the vertical trade lane as it's described, because the Rishi maze is above the ordinary galaxy when talking about the galactic plane, has been shut down by the Empire. And I assume that's referring to the Zareka string. So because of the blockade and the heavy Imperial presence, Han is forced to take a less direct route, but which in turn means he has to navigate dangers within the maze itself. The maze, of course, was not only dangerous and also difficult to navigate, but it was hard to detect the rebel station within all the background radiation and whatever else. So Han really has his work cut out for him here. The radiation actually becomes so bad that Han has to shut down the cockpit and work from the more secluded and protected engineering station within the ship. As they travel further into the maze and closer to the supermassive black hole, energy and gravity readings are increasing, and really without Han, Chewie, and the Falcon's impressive Navi computer, they probably wouldn't have made it. The Falcon, however, encounters something very strange and unexpected within the Rishi maze. I'll read a quote. Chills went up his spine as he realized what he was really looking at. Not pieces of broken ships, but rather pieces of a single ship, a battle cruiser, thousands of meters long, its spine long snapped by the impact of the gravitational field. This was in fact an ancient Sith battle cruiser, one so old that Han didn't even recognize its design from old history books or his time in the Imperial Academy. Despite being dead for probably thousands of years, the Sith ship still had active automated defenses, which the Falcon only barely manages to escape, but soon after they actually stumble across the Alliance base, which is described as a rock orbiting a star that in turn was orbiting less than 1.5 terameters from the event horizon of the black hole, with the base itself harnessing the energy of the black hole. As Han communicates with the rebels aboard the base and is about to dock to unload his supplies, Chewbacca gives them one final scan and discovers a beradium bomb. A bomb powerful enough to take out not just the station, but probably a good chunk of the planet that it was orbiting. This was of course a pretty smart setup by the Empire, work with smugglers to covertly, and accidentally against their will, move a bomb into to an alliance base. The only problem is the cargo bay doors aren't working, so although Han knows the bomb's on the ship, he can't easily get rid of it. He's forced to don a spacesuit, move outside on the Millennium Falcon, despite there being a black hole nearby, and manually pull open the door of the cargo hold. Han's actually almost killed here because a piece of debris knocks his spacesuit's power off and he loses his magnetic seal to the Millennium Falcon and starts to drift towards the black hole. As he sees the light from the Beradium bomb just be sucked up in an instant, he's thankfully rescued by the Falcon. Yeah, that's it. They deliver the rest of their cargo and promise to go have a word with the person who set them up on that mission. All in all, Maze Run is a really fun adventure. I love that era of Han and Chewie, the pre-Alliance era, because they did have lots of fun missions, and this one's cool because not only do they encounter a Sith Dreadnought, but they travel to another galaxy. Han almost gets sucked into a black hole and he thinks how that would be a pretty cool way to go out, but of course, they make it out at the end of the day, and Han is reminded that he's a good pilot, but so is Chewie. The story did raise a few questions for me though. First of all, what kind of energy was being harnessed from a black hole? One of the essential cross-section books, I can't remember which one, actually describes facilities around black holes which would take some type of energy and use it to power things like repulsor lifts, so I wonder if that's what the Alliance base was doing there? I mean, other places also describe repulsor lifts as being built on planets like Bakura and the Truce at Bakura, but I don't know, it's Star Wars, black holes are inconsistent 
consistently described, especially in a universe which normally doesn't have relativity, either general or special. But the other question is, why didn't the Rebel Alliance set up more bases outside the galaxy? I mean, the more you're making the Empire work and expand themselves, you'd think the more that you can tear apart their defenses and attack vulnerable parts of the Empire. They've got to go all the way to another galaxy to try to hunt you down. That's pretty good for you, especially if it is as dangerous to large ships as it seems to be. I can imagine the Alliance having perhaps a readout somewhere in, outside the galaxy, whether the Rishi Maze, Companion Besh, or otherwise. That also reminds me of the end of the Empire Strikes Back. For a long time, it was said that that was another galaxy. I'm talking about that footage I showed at the beginning of the video. Now, I believe the official explanation is that they're looking at a proto star or something, which I think is pretty lame. I like the idea that the Alliance just got their ass beat so bad that they literally have to run away from the galaxy into deep space for a while just to recover. Hey guys, Eckhart Slatter here once again diving into the weird parts of Star Wars Legends. And today we're looking at the top five scariest things and a thing can be a phenomenon or a person or a place or an event. We're going to keep it pretty general. So with that being said, let's get right into it. Number five is hyperspace. And I know what you're thinking, how is hyperspace weird? It's just how people get around in the galaxy. Well, that is of course true. Hyperspace is the main way that people travel long distance, but no one in the Star Wars galaxy really knows how it works, just that they're switching between different dimensions. I mean, just the fact that they are entering another dimension to go through the universe and they don't really know what they're doing, that alone that mystery makes it kind of creepy to me. There's also the fact that hyperspace travel can go very, very wrong. Take for example the Charon. They were involved in a hyperspace disaster which ended up leaving them stranded in a weird dimension called Other Space. And Other Space, at least to me, is super creepy. Instead of being all black with twinkling stars like regular space is, Other Space is completely white with little bits of black shining through. The Charon were stuck in other space for so long that they developed a death cult. And as is suggested by the name, the primary teaching of the death cult is that all life is to return to the void of death. And that's just creepy. So yeah, ending up in other space is certainly a real threat when traveling through hyperspace. You could also just accidentally fly into a star or hit an asteroid, or even if you're really unlucky, somehow travel through time. Although I guess that's really not as bad as exploding. There's just something bizarre about going into another dimension, and it almost seems like people from the normal dimension aren't even really meant to be in hyperspace. So for example, you wouldn't really want to look out the window for too long while you were traveling, because you could get what was called hyper rapture, which was essentially some sort of madness. Number four is Darth Nihilus, the Lord of Hunger. First of all, just look at his outfit, especially his mask. I mean, it's pure terror. But I mean, compared to the rest of him, it's really not so bad. Nihilus was present for the detonation of the mass shadow generator during the Battle of Malachor V. Somehow, experiencing this great destruction turned him into a wound of the Force. Now what this exactly is is kind of uncertain, but when there's a great amount of trauma or loss of life, the Force itself literally sustains an injury. And Darth Nihilus was actually the living, breathing version of that injury. Eventually Nihilus' physical body decayed, and he became simply a spirit residing within robes and armor. But he continued to grow in power and developed a hunger for life and for the Force. And eventually, really, the Sith Lord became more of a force of nature rather than any sort of actual being. All in all, Nilius' motivations, his look, his voice, and everything about him make him worth the number four spot on this list. Number three is the Star Weird, and I've talked about them briefly in a recent video, so I'm not going to go too in-depth. But Star Weirds were like these ghosts in space, and they have a really disturbing look to them. They're extremely gaunt and long, they have flowing white hair which will flow even if there's no wind, and they have very dead looking eyes. But really how they act is more frightening than what they look like, and they existed only in deep, deep parts of space, and it seems like they would kind of just float there until someone came nearby. And when someone did come nearby, especially if they were force sensitive, they would go through the ship, start screaming at them with this terrible shriek, and then they would kill them with their claws. And the only way you can really fight them is through the force or through a force field, and conventional weapons won't do any harm to them. All in all, these creatures are extremely powerful. They seem to be somehow connected to the dark side of the force. And it's just creepy that they lurk in the deep parts of space waiting for victims. And oh yeah, tying back to number five, they will also appear in hyperspace sometimes. Number two, I've split between two different things because they're extremely similar. And the first thing I want to talk about briefly is the now now. 
and I've mentioned the Nal Nal in two previous videos, but I will briefly give a little recap right now. The Nal Nal was pretty much grey goo and all of the Nal Nals seemed to operate as one conscious sentient being. And the Nal Nals main goal was to cause as much harm and as much suffering as possible and they were really sick and kind of disturbing. There were a few things they did and the main one was taking over living beings. They would find some sort of orifice in a living being's body and enter them and then replace their insides and their brain with their grey goo. And eventually after they had done that over a few days they could actually take that person over. And they were just really weird like they would do things like collect thousands of starships and make a ring around their home planet or cause people extreme amounts of suffering by killing their child in front of them, reanimating it, killing it again over and over and over again. Many species believe that the Nal Nal was actually from another dimension and kind of even to make things a little bit creepier, it's also been theorized that the great hyperspace disturbance which bisects the unknown regions was created to keep the Nal Nal away from the rest of the galaxy. So these creatures, or I guess I should say this creature, is so disturbing, so deadly, and so really just destructive that it had to be isolated from the rest of the galaxy. And just the fact that this thing came from another dimension, not unlike, say, Waru, kind of just adds to the general uneasiness. The Nal Nal was very similar to Imperial Project Blackwing, which was of course also very disturbing and some people have suggested that the two are actually the same. Project Blackwing used a viral agent known as the sickness and when you were infected with the sickness this fluid started to accumulate within your body and eventually it would replace all of your organs including of course your brain. Once it had full control of your body you were pretty much a zombie and you were at the will of the sickness and there was really nothing that could be done at that point. Number one is the closest thing that Star Wars will probably ever get to Lovecraftian horror. And that of course is Abeloth, and the story around Abeloth and her effects on others I think is incredibly interesting and also pretty disturbing. Abeloth's story is very very weird and I'm not going to cover it all in this video, but she was born as just a normal person. However, she served the extremely powerful ones and eventually became the mother. Unlike the ones, she wasn't actually immortal, so her life was coming to an end while her family, obviously, was continuing to live. In a bid to try to get this power, she drank from the font of power and bathed in the pool of knowledge. And these were very powerful force areas located in the realm of Beyond Shadows. And I mean, Beyond Shadows is weird enough. It's kind of like this alternate dimension that you get to by meditating for a really long time and disconnecting the force from your body. And while there, you have crazy force visions of the past and the future, and you can go to these really powerful force areas, which are called force nexuses. Anyway, her actions ended up turning her into Abeloth, and Abeloth is an extremely powerful dark side entity. She was actually so powerful that the ones in the Killix worked together to imprison her within the Maw, and the Maw is the center of the Star Wars galaxy. And they did so by creating extremely powerful technological artifacts, including Centerpoint Station and Sinkhole Station. Anyway, I'm getting off track, but just being near Sinkhole Station would cause people who were force sensitive to get these crazy visions and actually get what was called force psychosis. And this was an extreme form of paranoia and mental illness just caused by being so close to this extremely powerful entity. Abeloth was actually extremely powerful in other ways as well. She could drain people of their force energy, which obviously killed them. She could take over people's minds and she could assume any, any appearance that she wanted to. And her standard appearance is actually really creepy too. She had long, kind of blonde hair, a mouth that went from ear to ear, and very frightening eyes, and probably most notably tentacles for arms. She's just so weird and actually so powerful too and dangerous and so much so that Jedi and Sith work together to defeat her. I'm not sure if I actually like her as a character, but just the fact that her pure power that she exudes is able to affect the minds of people that are around her and that she's dabbled with these really powerful dark side uh, and light side too powers is just just all really disturbing and really creepy and for that reason she's the number one scariest thing in the Star Wars universe. Anyways guys, I really hope you enjoyed this list. I know that a lot of you like the weird part of Star Wars Legends, so this video was for you. Let me know down in the comments if you like this list and of course if there's anything that you think I missed. Also if you made it this far, let me know down in the comments how well you think your favorite horror movie character or creature, whether good or bad, would do in the Star Wars universe. Anyways. Thank you guys so much for watching. This has been Eckhart's Ladder. I'll speak to you again very soon, and may the Force be with you. 
Hey guys, Eckhart Slatter here today bringing you some more Star Wars discussion. And today we're talking about one of the most interesting parts of the Legends and current canon, the Unknown Regions. For those of you who don't know, the Unknown Regions are basically the unexplored, uncharted space outside of the galaxy. What's always been most interesting about the Unknown Regions in my opinion, is that there's almost an infinite amount of stories that can be told. Anything could be hiding there, any enemy, any planet, any ancient technology. The old canon especially took that idea of anything as possible and ran with it. I think the new canon will actually continue that trend. Legends canon had sentient entities roaming throughout the unknown regions, the Chiss Empire, things like the outbound flight, remnants of the Yuzang Vong, ancient empires like the Rakata, and other mysterious forces which resided in the unknown regions. This is all really interesting and you can learn about this stuff for hours and I really encourage you to do so, but I think the more interesting thing right now is to think about how the new canon will treat the unknown regions. Until Empire's End, we really didn't know a whole lot about the unknown regions in the new canon. We had one official map from Lucasfilm which told us that Rakata Prime still existed in the unknown regions and that Starkiller Base was in the unknown regions, but besides that, not much else. We also did know from the Clone Wars TV show that the planet Ilum in the unknown regions was mined for kyber crystals. But with the release of Empire's End this week, there's been a flood of new information. One of the things which we learned in which I discussed more in depth in a previous video is that Palpatine's personal Super Star Destroyer, the Eclipse, is stationed in the Unknown Regions in hiding. I think more interestingly, we are also explicitly introduced to the idea of observatories. Now, observatories are basically these facilities that can be used to track sentient beings. These observatories were used largely by Emperor Palpatine to track Sith artifacts. However, and this is incredibly interesting, we know that the observatory on Jakku is pointed away from the galaxy, i.e. towards the unknown region. So there is, at the very least, something very interesting going on in the unknown regions, and the Emperor knew this. More on this in a moment. The book also tells us that travel through the unknown regions, and especially exploration, is nearly, if not completely, impossible. Ships that do try to traverse the void are either destroyed or returned without their passengers. That's some pretty spooky shit. The book also tells us that Palpatine is keeping Grand Admiral Thrawn around, largely because of his knowledge of the unknown regions. Because remember, in current as well as Legends canon, Thrawn was born and raised on a planet outside of the galaxy. And apparently Palpatine actually used Thrawn's knowledge to help him program the observatory on Jakku. But again to the question, what was the Emperor looking for? And this is where things continue to get really weird. Apparently there's a dark, unknown presence lurking in the unknown region. This is a malevolent substance that is calling out to the Emperor himself. Not even Vader, who is incredibly strong with the Force, could feel this presence. It seems obvious that these observatories are trying to find out what this presence was. There's a bit more complexity here though, because we know that Palpatine was developing a backup plan in case the Empire fell. His computers were basically trying to figure out a safe route through the unknown regions. And, based on the facts that the Eclipse ends up in the unknown regions in hiding, we know that he was at least partially successful. I think all things considered we're left with two major questions. The first is, simply, what is lurking outside of the galaxy? What is this evil presence? We know in the old canon that Palpatine may have had knowledge of the Yuzang Vong, the extragalactic force that would invade the galaxy, but that's probably not what's going on here. Whatever this is, it seems more connected to the force itself, to the dark side. Almost like Darth Nilius, for example, from Knights of the Old Republic 2. To me, the answer is obvious. And I know I've said this a few times, but it's gotta be Snoke. With his deformed figure and his shadowy presence, he almost does seem like the embodiment of evil. We also know that he wasn't present on Starkiller Base, and that he was somewhere else. I mean, it all seems to fit the bill pretty clearly. If this is Snoke, in fact, we've learned a lot about him from Empire's End. That he is extremely powerful, but that only Palpatine was able to sense him. Although I wonder if at some point Luke was able to as well. We also know that he's tied closely to the dark side and seemingly darkness and evil in general. He's probably some sort of ancient power as well. And that Palpatine was interested in him, and that he may have actually made contact with him. The second question is also worthy of some deep consideration, and it's to what degree did Palpatine actually manage to map the Unknown Region, if at all, and to what degree did he explore the Unknown Region? And if they did manage to do some exploring, did they find anything interesting? As I said a few times now, we know the Eclipse, at least at one point between Episode 6 and The Force Awakens was in the Unknown Region, but we don't know a whole lot other than that. 
Anyway, regardless of how we answer this question, we know one thing. This mysterious part of the galaxy has already played an important part in the new canon. And it seems clear to me that the unknown regions will appear in some major way in either episode 8 or episode 9. What is the dark presence in the unknown regions? And what was Palpatine looking for? Did Palpatine find a way to traverse the unknown regions? And will they feature heavily in episode 8 or episode 9? Post a comment below, and if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more. I'm going to try to put at least one of these out a week. Anyways guys, that's all the Star Wars I got in me today. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope to talk to you again soon.